What's up, ladies and gents? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Izuku with System Quirk. Part 7. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Ding. Hearing the sound of the doorbell, Izuku immediately opened his eyes, gently laying Melissa on the sofa before heading to the nearby intercom display to see who was outside. It was currently 5.23 a.m., so he wasn't exactly expecting guests. Ah. Recognizing the familiar figure of Melissa's father, David Shield, a wry smile developed across Izuku's face as he called out to the sleeping beauty, his voice gentle as he said, Melissa, your father is here. I can send him away but I don't think he'd appreciate it. M-N-N? -N? Rising to a seated position, Melissa asked, Papa's here, while rubbing her eyes. Then, as if a switch had been flipped inside her, she bounced to her feet, exclaiming, Papa, as she ran to the front entrance to answer it directly. This wasn't particularly wise, considering there were people with quirks that could mimic other people's voices and appearances, but Izuku followed behind her with a relaxed smile as he fixed his shirt. As Melissa opened the door and bounded into her father's arms, Izuka remained in the background, confirming the professor's identity before crossing his arms and leaning against the adjoining wall. He didn't want to interrupt the duo's reunion, so he waited for them to separate of their own accord, David looking at him with a slight frown as he said, Izuku. In a curt, almost threatening tone, raising his right hand, Izuku maintained a relaxed smile as he replied, It's good to see you, professor. How has your research been going? Shaking his head, David said, let's not talk about that right now. Before looking to Melissa, adopting a fatherly smile and adding, I came here to see and spend time with my daughter before the summit. Causing the smile on David's face to cramp, Melissa looked at Izuku as she asked, Is that okay, Izuku? I'm certain I won't be gone for too long. Of course, replied Izuku, smiling wryly in response to the threatening glimmer in David's eyes. The latter wasn't genuinely angry with him but no father appreciated having their daughters defer to their boyfriends for permission while they were around. The only thing more maddening was seeing their little girl call someone else daddy. After seeing the father-daughter duo off, Izuku returned to the sofa, lying down before pulling out his cell phone. 5.30 a.m. in New York was around 7.30 p.m. in Japan, so he wasn't surprised to find both the class and group chats were active, discussing work studies and club activities. Though clubs were typically associated with the general and support departments, Nothing prevented students from the hero course from partaking in after-school activities. Rather, now that UA had become a boarding school, mandating that all students live on campus, joining a club was pretty much expected. Opening an album the girls had sent him, Izuku smiled as he thumbed through images of them wearing idol-like outfits. Shino, Ryuko, Tomoko, and Yuwara had agreed to become advisors for a heroes-only club that specialized in self-promotion and marketing. Their group was one of the four hero teams that had founded the Union Affairs Office, so they had a lot to teach aspiring heroes that wanted to establish and maintain a hero organization. After idling about for several hours, bringing the time to 8.41 a.m., Izuku got up from the sofa to grab something to eat. Unfortunately, while the suite had a kitchen, pantry, and fridge, the latter was filled with drinks, and most of the cupboards were empty. How sloppy! Remarked Izuku closing the pantry door and heading to the front entrance. The moment he opened it, one of the agents outside, an inordinately tall man with a square jaw and notably angular features, asked, Is there something we can do for you, sir? Meeting the gaze of the shades-wearing man, Izuka replied, I'm hungry. Tell me where I can grab a bite to eat. There are dining facilities on the first and second floors, replied the man. However, we would appreciate it if you remained in your room. If there is a particular type of food you'd like to try, we will bring it to you. As he had already messaged Melissa, Tashinori, and Nizu to inform them he was going out, Izuku shook his head stating, I'm not going to spend my entire stay in New York trapped inside my room. Furrowing his brows, the angular man expressed, You're free to go, but we can't guarantee your safety if you venture off alone. 
Though his intuition triggered in response to the man's warning, Izuku maintained a relaxed smile as he replied, I appreciate your concern, but I'll be fine. If your people can prevent strangers from entering my room while I'm away, that's more than enough. Instead of trying to convince Izuku to stay, the angular man returned a curt nod, saying, Understood. Before stepping away, pressing his finger to his ear, and saying something to superiors. As for Izuku, he raised his hand as a casual greeting to the other agents before making his way past them, riding an antiquated-looking elevator with gold ornamentation and red carpets down to the second floor. Then, following the directions of the elevator operator, he soon found himself in a well-lit dining room with predominantly white furniture accented by bronze frames. Before Izuku could get a good look around, a sharply dressed woman with angular eyes, blue and white fur, and the literal head of a wolf approached him to ask, Will you be dining alone sir, or are you awaiting your companions? Recovering from his momentary stupor Izuku replied, I'll be eating alone, but have reason to believe others will be joining me. Then I'll seat you at a table for four, responded the wolf-like woman, taking the initiative to lead the way. Izuka's eyes nearly lowered to her bushy tail as she turned around, but while he was certainly interested in heteromorphs, he wasn't a furry. He just had a healthy curiosity. Here we are, said the woman, gesturing toward a booth near the back corner of the dining area. Then, once Izuku had taken his seat, she adopted a practiced smile and said, My name is Luna De Luca, and it is my privilege to be your server today, mister. Paragon, replied Izuku. He wasn't in costume at the moment, but Nizu and Tashinori had both advised him to get used to utilizing his hero name while he was abroad. After all, while he didn't hold an official position, he was, technically, a representative of Japan. Okay, Mr. Paragon, replied Luna, briefly sounding like a Bostonian as she pulled out a palm pad and asked, What can I get you to drink? A cup of ice water and some saffron tea, please, replied Izuku. He didn't know if they had saffron tea, but considering the Waldorf Astoria was one of the most prestigious hotels in New York, catering to dignitaries from all over the world, they should be able to manage just about any request. Nodding her head, Luna offered a curt understood. Before asking, and can I get you any appetizers? I recommend the scallop mousse and the steak tartare. We import scallops from Novigrad and Wagyu directly from Japan, so their flavor is guaranteed. I'll take both, replied Izuku, adopting an innately playful smile as he added, I have a big appetite. I'll be sure to inform the chefs, mused Luna narrowing her distinctly golden eyes slightly before abruptly turning away to convey his order to the kitchen. Her reaction caused Izuka's brows to rise, but he didn't think much of it, as he habitually checked the wolf girl's status. Name, Luna de Luca. Title, Party Invitation Required. Quirk, Grey Wolf. Bond Level, 71. Current Level, 18. Effective Level, 35. Attributes. Strength. 19 Agility, 38 Vitality, 81 Intelligence, 63 Dexterity, 45 Luck, 107 Free Attributes, 90. Perks, Party Invitation Required. It seems I made a good impression, thought Izuku, subsequently adopting a wry smile and shaking his head. He wasn't in the world of Ishizoku reviewers, and already had more than his fair share of beautiful and amazing women. He also had reason to believe this wasn't his final life. So rather than trying to sample every interesting or exotic woman he encountered, he should focus on overcoming his trials and becoming an actual paragon. With such thoughts in mind, Izuku surveyed the dining room, inspecting the statuses of everyone he could see. Most had levels between 10 to 15, but there were a few outliers in the 20s and 30s, presumably serving as bodyguards or private security. Upon finishing with his sweep, Izuku thought, doesn't look like any of my future enemies or classmates are present. Yet another false positive, courtesy of intuition. Though his intuition triggered as if to spite him, Izuku ignored it, pulling out his phone and placing it on the table. Then, picking up the tablet that was present, he looked through the surprisingly diverse menu, taking note of the fact that he could send orders directly to the kitchen. Not everyone enjoyed having a waiter or waitress continually intruding upon their meal, so there were options to keep them away, change servers, or have dishes delivered to the table via a trolley-like robot. Interrupting Izuka's perusal of the menus, Luna returned with a long-necked pitcher, an ornate crystal glass, a tiny jade teapot, and several styles of serving cups, setting them on the table as she mused, you're in luck. We just had some fresh saffron shipped in from Tyler, Texas. I'm not particularly fond of the South, but God knows they produce some world-class spices. Having looked into the States after his reincarnation, 
Izuku understood why Luna might not be fond of the South. Southern hospitality was still a thing, but like a disheartening number of countries and communities, they weren't very welcome of heteromorphs. There were even a few extremist groups that believed heteromorphs should be subservient to humans, so most stuck to the East and West Coast, choosing to live in heteromorphic communes and more progressive cities. Instead of latching onto the conversation bait Luna had dangled for him, Izuku took a moment to sample the tea she had provided. He hadn't put in any sugar or honey, so it had a subtle sweet and tart flavor, common among flour-based teas. Still, while it left a distinctly bitter aftertaste in his mouth, Izuku enjoyed it quite a bit. Seeing as Luna was patiently awaiting his response, her long and bushy tail wagging ever so slightly as she loomed over his table, Izuku adopted a wry smile and said, It's delicious. Adopting a smile that reminded Izuku of the husky he had kept for a few years in his previous life, Luna replied, Glad to hear it, before pulling out her pad and asking, Now, are you ready to order or would you like to wait until your appetizers have arrived? I'll take whatever you recommend, replied Izuku, the corners of his smile naturally curling upward as he added, This is my first time in the States, and I enjoy trying new things. Catching Izuku more than a little off guard, Luna promptly took a seat next to him, grabbing the menu tablet and perking up quite a bit as she said, Well if you're not in a hurry, we have a 12-course tasting meal that includes three types of oysters, ebony lobster, caviar with smoked sabayon, marinated duck breast, a vegetable platter, and a truffle-based puree. Instead of responding to Luna's meal suggestion, Izuku adopted a wry smile and remarked, I can't imagine it's customary for members of the service staff to sit at the table of guests. Leaving Izuku at another loss for words, Luna responded to him with a playful wink, musing, Consider it a special service. Besides, didn't you say this was your first time in the States? Feel free to ask me anything you're curious about. New York was practically my playground growing up. With Luna leaning a little closer to him, her nose twitching ever so slightly, Izuka realized what was happening. Nizu had informed him about the peculiarities of his blood, and Narumi had confirmed that his pheromones were a lot more potent than the average person's. Luna's quirk gave her a sense of smell that was hundreds of times more powerful than a typical human, so even if he acted casually, she could perceive his interest. The things some people do for tips, thought Izuku. However, instead of outright refusing Luna's company, he suppressed his better judgment and decided to ask her a few questions, initially about New York and then about the other guests staying at the hotel. With her exceptional hearing, she was bound to have overheard a few interesting tidbits of information. Staring at the slip of paper containing a phone number and the time when Luna finished her shift, Izuku shook his head and exhaled a faint sigh. He had similar thoughts in the past, but the ease at which he was able to get the apparently Italian girl's number left him once again thinking he was in an eroge or a dejinchi. It's a real shame. Muttered Izuku, crumpling up the slip of paper and slipping it into his pocket to dispose of later. He wouldn't have minded having a one-night stand with Luna, but there was a time and a place for everything, and he wasn't in a position to act without inhibitions. He did, however, leave her a 300% service tip since he felt responsible for giving her the wrong impression. With the elevator reaching the floor he was staying on, Izuka's eyes opened in surprise when the doors parted to reveal Tashinori in a yellow tuxedo and Kathleen, the latte resembling a female bodybuilder that had squeezed themselves into a black dress. While Tashinori's eyes widened like Izuku's, Kathleen smiled broadly and said, Oh if it isn't your sidekick. What was his hero name again? I think it was something cute like Kyokun. It's Paragon, replied Tashinori, waggling the index finger of his right hand as he added, Also he's not my sidekick. Paragon here might be young, but he's already a fine hero. Oh, if it's you saying it, it must be true, mused Kathleen, extending her left fist to Izuku as she added, Nice to meet you, kiddo. Though he was somewhat reluctant, Izuku returned Kathleen's fist bump, replying, It's nice to meet you as well. Are the two of you heading down to get something to eat? Adopting a massive toothy grin, Kathleen elbowed Tashinori in the side, stating, It's my job to keep this big lug in check if he goes out of control. So yeah we're grabbing a bite to eat together. I'd invite you to join us, but I'm sure you have your own thing going on. Understanding that Kathleen was effectively telling him to stay out of the way, Izuka returned a curt nod and said, some other time then. Before making way for the golden-haired duo, Kathleen fawning over Tashinori risked throwing a wrench into his plans, but the latter's private life wasn't exactly his business. Before the elevator doors could close, Tashinori said, sir was looking for you. He's staying in room 4203. Noted, replied Izuku, 
raising his hand in a casual farewell gesture and waiting for the doors to close before turning around. Waltzing down a corridor filled with suit and sunglasses wearing agents as he made his way to Nizu's suite. Several followed him with their gazes, but none tried to bar his passage as he approached the reinforced door numbered 4203 and pressed the doorbell. Are you Izuku Midoriya? asked the voice of a woman over the intercom. Last I checked, replied Izuku, raising his brows slightly as he pondered who the voice belonged to. He knew Nizu was planning to introduce him to the Pendragons, but he figured it would occur at a private dinner party or something similar. You are permitted entry, said the woman, followed by the door unlocking with a heavy thud. When it opened, a petite woman in a maid outfit came into view, her inky black hair styled in two distinct buns and her pupilless golden eyes exhibiting little emotion as she stared up at Izuku with a gaze that caused his intuition to trigger. Name, Ferris Lindsay Harrington. Title, Arachnoid Assassin. Agility plus 30, Vitality plus 20, Dexterity plus 50. Quirk, Death Leg. Bond Level, 50. Current Level, 63. Effective Level, 106. Attributes. Strength, 88 Agility, 132 Vitality, 309 Intelligence, 124 Dexterity, 289 Luck, 119 Free Attributes, 315. Perks Cold-Blooded Skills Stealth, Homing, Armor Piercing, Explosive Ordnance, Cold-Blooded, Invisible to Thermal Detection. Stealth, Able to Blend into Your Environment, Becoming Harder to Detect. Homing, Fires Bullets that can curve around an object to hit a specified target. Armor Piercing, Fires a High-Velocity Bullet that can penetrate most defenses. Explosive Ordnance, Fire an incendiary projectile that can bounce off surfaces and be detonated remotely. Seeing the petite woman's title, level, perk and skills, Izuka's eyes widened quite a bit. Ferris's resembled an ordinary maid at a glance, but everything about her status made it clear she took out more than simple garbage. Sensing that Izuku had seen through her, Ferris narrowed her eyes almost imperceptibly as she stood to the side, gesturing toward the room's interior as she said, Sir Nizu and my mistress are awaiting you within. Though it caused the hair on the back of his neck to stand up, Izuku made his way past Ferris, making his way deeper into the suite to find Nizu and a remarkably beautiful woman with pale golden hair sitting at opposite ends of a dining table. Her level wasn't particularly impressive, but the status of two lasses beside her caused Izuku's pupils to contract to the size of pinholes. Name, Juliana Soliel Pendragon Title, Frost Queen, Vitality plus 100, Quirk, Incitement. Bond Level, 57. Current Level, 34. Effective Level, 35. Attributes. Strength, 14 Agility, 25 Vitality, 332 Intelligence, 118 Dexterity, 51 luck, 77 free attributes, 170. Perks. Ice affinity, skills, lesser mana detection, second circle ice magic, ice affinity. Increases affinity for and resistance against ice. Lesser mana detection, able to sense and manipulate mana to an extent. Second circle ice magic, able to manipulate ice elemental energy to freeze or reduce the mobility of targets. Known spells, ice bolt, frost touch, Snowfield. Name, Historia Cunegunda Pendragon Title. Chosen Knight of the Foundry. Strength plus 100. Agility plus 100. Vitality plus 200. Luck plus 100. Quirk, Lord of Camelot. Armory, Displacement, Tempest, Discernment. Bond Level, 57. Current Level, 81. Effective Level, 188. Attributes. Strength. 144 Agility, 163 Vitality, 959 Intelligence, 89 Dexterity, 142 Luck, 407. Free Attributes, 90. Perks Authority Artorias, Mana Detection, Dragon's Heart, Dragon Scales, Wind Manipulation, Skills, Omni Weapon Specialist, Fifth Circle Wind Magic, Elementalization, Great Divide, Decapitating Strike, Spatial Pierce, Authority. The one who bears the authority of Artorias possesses great charisma and can only be slain by a member of their own family. Restriction, British Isles, Dragon's Heart. Vitality and mana capacity increase exponentially with age. Dragon Scales, the user is impervious to most forms of blunt, piercing and magical damage but weak against weapons with the anti-divine and anti-dragon traits. Wind Manipulation, 
the user can feel the flow of air around them and manipulate it freely. Omni Weapon Specialist The user has innate familiarity with most types of weapons. Fifth Circle Wind Magic Able to manipulate wind elemental energy to hasten movements and slice through opponents. Known spells Haste, Arrowbolt, Tempest Armor, Garuda's Wing, Wind of Fortune, Hurricane Crash, Elementalization. Able to transform the body into wind elemental energy for a short period. Great Divide. Condense mana to create a blade capable of splitting the earth and foes alike. Decapitating Strike. Drastically increases cutting power when aiming for the neck of an opponent. Spatial Pierce. An attack that ignores distance and defense to pierce a target in a straight line. Name. Rebecca Schneider. Title. Tiny Tinkerer. Intelligence plus 50. Luck plus 50. Quirk. Metallurgy. Bond level, 64. Current level, 59. Effective level, 108. Attributes. Strength, 63 agility, 27 vitality, 353 intelligence, 215 dexterity, 165 luck, 257 free attributes, 295 perks, genius, mana detection, dexterous fingers, skills, cartography, auto mapping, sense trap, Trap Activation, Sense Treasure, Resource Detection. Monster Magnet, Genius, Doubles Experience Gains. Half as effective when sharing experience. Mana Detection, Able to sense and manipulate mana to a reasonable degree. Dexterous Fingers, Your fingers are quick, incredibly flexible, and allow you to discern things through touch, even with your eyes closed. Cartography, Allows the user to produce maps, so long as they are supplied with mana and ink. Auto mapping. When actively utilizing a map, an area of 5 by 5 meters is automatically inscribed. Sense trap. Diffuse mana through a terrain or dungeon to detect traps within 20 meters. Additional mana can be used to increase the range up to 100 M. Trap activation. Remotely activate traps detected by the sense trap skill. Sense treasure. Diffuse mana through a terrain or dungeon to detect treasure within 20 meters. Additional mana can be used to increase the range up to 100 M. Resource Detection Automatically detect water, rare minerals, and other natural resources within 10 meters. Monster Magnet You are the natural enemy of mimics, changelings, and doppelgangers. Monsters will instinctually prioritize attacking you. Before Izuku could thoroughly peruse their statuses, Juliana remarked, You must be Izuku Midoriya the young man that will soon attend the Royal Academy of Heroics alongside my daughter Historia. Sir Nizu has told us much about you. Bowing his head respectfully but maintaining a dignified countenance, Izuku courteously replied, It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Lady Pendragon. Likewise, replied Juliana, shifting her gaze to Historia and Rebecca, stating, Introduce yourselves. Rising to her feet Historia, wearing a sleeveless white blouse with a blue ribbon, a blue skirt and black stockings, crossed a hand over her chest and bowed at a concise, 15-degree angle as she said, Well met, Sir Midoriya. My name is Historia Cunegunda Pendragon, but my friends call me Histi. In public and at school, please refer to me as Arthur. Frowning slightly, Juliana looked like she wanted to correct Historia, but ultimately remained silent. At the same time Rebecca, her pigtailed head barely above the table surface when standing, performed an awkward bow and nervously muttered, It's nice to meet you. My name is Rebecca Waldorf. At school, please refer to me as Bedivere. Nodding his head, Izuku emulated Historia's act of placing her hand over her chest, bowing his head slightly as he replied, It's a pleasure to make your acquaintances, Historia Rebecca. I generally do my own thing, but I look forward to fighting alongside you within the breaches. It's convenient that you would bring that up, said Nizu. It appears that Ms. Historia and Ms. Rebecca have been clearing C and B rank breaches for quite some time. Their most recent venture placed them against a vast horde of goblins, led by a hobgoblin chieftain. Though it earned her a disproving look from her mother, Historia's eyes glistened as she added, it was a heart-poundingly thrilling experience. When the hobgoblin chieftain summoned a series of tiny meteors, why, I thought my heart might burst out of my chest. Matching Juliana's expression, Rebecca frowned as she cast a sidelong glance at her lifelong friend and softly lamented, You're making a scene, Histi. Indeed, added Juliana. However, instead of chastising her daughter, she redirected her gaze to Izuku, asking, If you don't mind my asking, what level are you, Sir Midoriya? Sir Nizu informs me you have at least some familiarity with the breaches. Though he tensed slightly, 
Izuku showed no obvious signs of hesitation as he replied, I recently attained level 50. However, in terms of stats, I am closer to level 110 and can enhance my body to approximate the stats of a level 900. Hearing Izuku's response, Juliana's usually cold borderline apathetic countenance gave way to an expression of dignified yet open-mouthed stupefaction. Rebecca exhibited a markedly more comical version of the same emotion, but Historia's reaction stood out the most. Like the battle junkie Izuku suspected her to be, a broad smile blossomed across Historia's face, her green eyes glistening as she linked her hands behind her back and said, Once you become a student at the academy, it would be my honor to face you in a duel. Absolutely not, interjected Juliana, staring at her daughter as if Historia had lost her mind. Unfortunately, the latter didn't seem to hear her as her gaze was firmly fixed on Izuku, awaiting his response like a child that had just asked Santa if they could have a pony for Christmas. With Juliana ultimately shifting her gaze toward him, her stare even more intense than her daughter's, carrying with it an unspoken threat, the smile on Izuka's face visibly cramped as he awkwardly replied, allies shouldn't fight amongst themselves. After seeing Juliana, Historia, Rebecca, and Ferris off, Izuku exhaled a sigh of relief, prompting Nizu to muse, quite the interesting young lady isn't she? Shaking his head, Izuku forced a smile and replied, I'm more interested in her mother, not that I have any intention of pursuing either of them. Exhaling a light chuckle, Nizu mused, Ah yes, Lady Pendragon is quite the exceptional beauty, isn't she? Lord Pendragon is a lucky man. With Nizu gesturing back toward the dining room, Izuku accompanied him, reclaiming the seat he had just risen from a few minutes prior. Nizu did the same, linking his paw-like fingers together before asking, So, how were they? I assume you committed their statuses to memory. Nodding his head, Izuku revealed, Lady Pendragon's level wasn't very high, but she appears to have a basic mastery of ice elemental magic. As for Historia Rebecca, and that scary maid, the former has the potential to be a monster. Her five quirks aside, she possesses perks that make her borderline indestructible and functionally immortal within the boundaries of the British Isles. Raising his non-existent brows, Nizu remarked, that's some useful information, and it certainly explains her bravado. Shaking his head, Izuku asserted, I don't think she's aware of it. At the very least, her parents aren't. If they were, I doubt they'd let her travel abroad like this. Ikonkua, replied Nitsu. As far as I'm aware, those that have gained access to status windows cannot see their perks. That seems to be an ability unique to you and those within your party. Speaking of which, are those with status windows able to view or share their statuses with others? Asked Izuku. I've been wondering that for a while now. It is possible to share, but there also seems to be a skill called red that allows certain individuals to view the status windows of others, including monsters, revealed Nizu. However, if there is a large disparity between the level of the user and the target being observed, it only reveals partial information. Seems fairly useful. Remarked Izuku, adopting a somewhat cheeky smile as he added, though, not as useful as my inherent observation ability. I've yet to meet a single person whose status I couldn't read in full. Nodding his head, Nizu mused, indeed. Your observation ability might very well be one of the most valuable aspects of your quirk. Information has always played a vital role in war and politics. When utilized properly, it can provide considerable leverage over people and circumstances as a whole. Punctuating his statement, Nizu pulled out his palm-sized holographic projector, triggering it to reveal the image of Izuku conversing with Luna in the second-floor dining hall. From an outside perspective, it looked a little surreal to see a wolf-headed woman interacting with a comparably ordinary-looking human. Before Izuku could ask, Nizu revealed, I had already hacked into the hotel security and surveillance systems before leaving Japan. I'm not fond of being spied on, and my crawlers will let me know if any Enwells access or attempt to compromise the building's security. Narrowing his eyes slightly, Izuku flatly remarked, I'm also not fond of being spied on. I'm afraid that can't be avoided in this situation, said Nizu. With the President of the United States temporarily residing here, you can expect everyone in this building to be closely monitored. There are a number of intentional blind spots, particularly within the high-end suites, but there are no less than seven satellites and more than a hundred agents keeping a close eye on everyone moving in, out, and about this building. Though he could understand why security was so tight, Izuku couldn't help exhaling an exasperated sigh. Security at the expense of privacy had been a touchy subject in his previous world. He hated being spied on, 
but he would definitely want to know what people were up to if they entered his home or a place he was charged with safeguarding. Shaking such thoughts from his mind, Izuku met Nizu's gaze, asking, any particular reason you pulled up this hologram? Three, actually, replied Nizu, explaining, first and foremost, I wanted to remind you that your actions are being closely monitored. Secondly, if you decide to pursue this particular heteromorphic woman, you should be aware that she has ties to the Italian Mafia. If she suddenly invites you to meet her family, I suggest you politely refuse. Wait seriously, asked Izuku. If that's the case, how'd she manage to get a job in a hotel that caters to the president? Exhaling an amused chuckle, Nisa's eyes gleamed as he said, though they would deny it, the American government has close ties with most of the criminal organizations and groups that have established roots in their country. Ms. DeLuca's family owns the construction firm that renovates and maintains the Waldorf Astoria and several other landmark buildings. By entrusting the matter to them, the governor doesn't have to worry as much about other organized groups since the mafia tends to clean house and take care of outsiders on their own. Though he didn't plan to pursue Luna as Nizu suggested, Izuku made a mental note not to piss off the peculiar wolf girl. He wasn't exactly scared of the mafia, but it was generally best not to offend groups that had been around for hundreds of years, especially if they operated enterprises that spanned the entire world. Seeing through Izuku's thoughts, Nizu raised his brows and remarked, I wasn't attempting to discourage you. Rather, I support how open-minded you are. A disheartening number of people regard those with mutant and heteromorphic quirks as less than human. Even if your feelings are simply the result of curiosity, I hope you continue to foster a positive relationship with the heteromorphic community. Exhaling another exasperated sigh, Izuku muttered, I don't even think about things like that unless someone else brings it up. Heteromorphs? Mutants? In the end, we're all people. Jerks that construct reasons we can't coexist are the real subhumans. Most people would agree with you, said Nizu. Unfortunately, it is often a very vocal minority that controls public discourse, often towards making people afraid. It's much easier to control people that way. Seeing the frown on Azuka's face, Nizu exhaled a soft chuckle and said, that's one of the reasons heroes are so important. It only takes one truly inspirational individual to inspire others to change for the better. Tashinori believes you have what it takes to become such an icon, and I agree. You may not be perfect, but you are compassionate and willing to put your life on the line to protect others. You also appear to have the literal support of our planet. That must account for something. You'd think so. Replied Izuku, adopting a wry smile as he considered himself grossly unqualified for the task set before him. He planned to give it his all, but as a Paragon candidate, he knew he wasn't the hero that Telania had desired. She simply couldn't afford to request the aid of a proper champion. Well, either way, you won't be going at it alone, said Nizu. You have a real knack for drawing others to you. If you ever find yourself in a pickle, you can expect that Tashinori, myself, or a member of your ever-growing party will pick up the slack. No one person should have to bear the fate of an entire world on their shoulders. Nodding in affirmation, Izuka's expression softened into a genuine smile as he replied, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you, Sensei. Returning a smile of his own, Nizu mused, no need for gratitude. As your principal, I have a duty to guide and support you. Now, I believe I've kept you here long enough. I also have other matters to attend, so unless you want to stick around and watch me pour over data streams and security footage, I'll see you sometime before your departure. Will you be okay alone? asked Izuku. I saw Tashinori heading to lunch with Kathleen. Adopting a somewhat scary smile, Nizu mused. You're mistaken if you believe that you and Tashinori Kuen are my only forms of protection. Bar the sudden appearance of our mutual enemy, I'm reasonably prepared for just about anything. To that end, feel free to venture outside and explore the city. You also have permission to act in the capacity of a hero but try to avoid any serious situations or circumstances where you interfere with the duties of other heroes. Raising his brows, Izuku asked, venturing outside, isn't that just asking to be targeted by the Chinese? Maintaining his smile, Nizu replied, heroes, especially famous ones, are constantly targeted by villains and criminal organizations. With the power at your behest, all you have to worry about are errors in judgment. That's a weakness that can only be overcome with experience, so go, cut loose, and have fun. Just be careful if you enter any nightclubs. Hollywood has glamorized American nightlife. 
It's really just a cesspool of lonely people looking to drown their sorrows in drugs and alcohol. As he had spent a substantial amount of time at nightclubs in his previous life, the smile on Izuku's face cramped. He knew Nizu wasn't launching a personal attack on him, but it felt personal, knowing how much time and money he had spent on women whose names he couldn't remember and expensive alcohol whose brands he couldn't pronounce. I'll keep that in mind, replied Izuku, rising to his feet as he added, see you around, sensei. Nodding his head, Nizu mused, take care, Midoriya-kun. Your flight is on the 5th, specifically at 9.30 a.m., so be sure to return before then. Though he was tempted to remark he had no intention of staying out of the hotel overnight, Izuku ultimately remained silent. Melissa had gone with her father to some conference where scientists from around the world had gathered to discuss the meta-world transversal phenomenon, so he had very little reason to remain in the hotel if Nizu didn't require his protection. With such thoughts in mind, Izuku departed Nizu's suite, passing by the secret service agents before stopping outside the entrance to his own. It was barely past 1 p.m., so he had at least four hours before the girls woke up back in Japan. Even then, they had classes to attend, so he could only exchange a few texts with them before they became too busy to respond. Earning curious looks from the secret service agent stationed outside, Izuku exhaled a sigh and rested his forehead against the cool surface of his door. It made him feel like an prick, but he was seriously considering accepting Luna's proposal to hit the town. Nizu's comment about going to a nightclub hadn't been randomly thrown out. Rather, before she gave him her phone number and informed him of when she would get off work, Luna had invited him to accompany her to a fairly famous club only a few blocks from the Astoria. Shaking his head, Izuku opened the door to his room, kicking off his shoes before entering the living room area and plopping down on the couch. As boring as it sounded, the smartest thing to do would be to stay in his room. He wasn't that curious about New York, and if he saw something going down, he wouldn't be able to ignore it. He might not have a justice boner like Tashinori, but he was still a hero, provisional or otherwise. Staring at a spot on the ceiling above, the notion that there might actually be something wrong with him entered Izuku's mind. A part of him craved action, but until now, he had gone out of his way to avoid getting involved in anything serious. Now that Nizu had more or less put him on the spot, intentionally or otherwise, he felt like he should be doing something more than sitting on his butt or taking a nap. Checking himself out in the mirror, dressed up in his hero costume, Izuku couldn't help remarking, I look like a jackass. Though he was quite fond of his costume, Izuku had never seriously worn it publicly. Now that he was considering going on patrol around New York, he suddenly felt reluctant. It didn't help that, while utilizing Black Whip, he looked more like a villain than a hero. Do 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 hearing the phone in his room, Izuku turned away from the mirror, making his way over to an ornate landline, seemingly comprised of gold and ivory. Hello? Apologies for the disturbance, but is this Mr. Paragon speaking? Asked an exasperated sounding man. Who's asking? Asked Izuku. This is Thomas Nicholson of the Concierge, calling on behalf of Ms. Luna De Luca. She insisted that the two of you were acquainted, explained the voice. Raising his brows, Izuku thought, I know her bond level shot up to 88, but I couldn't have left that deep an impression on her. Looking at the phone's built-in clock, Izuku noticed it was around 20 minutes after Luna's shift had ended. He figured she would just go about her business if he didn't show up, but he was apparently mistaken. Is she there right now? Asked Izuku. Before the concierge could respond, the sound of the phone being snatched away from him echoed through the phone, followed by the voice of Luna answering, He. Where the heck are you? Weren't we going to hit the town together? Sorry but some things came up, replied Izuku, adding, I didn't exactly come to New York to play around. Well are you busy right now? Asked Luna. We don't have to go clubbing or anything. We could always go for coffee. Or if you have time, maybe go to the mall, watch a movie, and grab a bite to eat? I know this darling little diner on West 23rd Street. Exhaling a faint sigh through his nose, Izuka replied, Sorry Luna, but I'm busy. Maybe some other time. Though there was a slight pause, Luna eventually replied, Hey, it's okay. I would have preferred it if you had let me know in person, but it is what it is. Let's talk tomorrow at breakfast, okay? Before Izuku could respond, Luna apparently returned the phone to the concierge, prompting him to state, I apologize for the inconvenience. It's fine, replied Izuku, hanging up the phone and feeling the slightest tinge of guilt. He hated lying to people and felt partially responsible for leading Luna on, even if that was never his intention. Odds were, 
She just wanted him to take her to an expensive restaurant or buy her some stuff, but he couldn't know that without actually going out with her. Shaking his head, Izuku made his way to the master bedroom, pulling out an armored briefcase and retrieving a thick laptop to peruse the files that Nizu had forwarded him. Luna might not have seen his hero costume, but she knew his hero name. New heroes drew a lot of attention, so now that he told her he was busy, going out on patrol was no longer an option. He could lie to her again by telling her he was forced to go out, but piling lies upon lies was rarely a good idea. I'm Bayarak, called out Melissa, entering Izuku's suit around 10.20 p.m. By then, Izuku had already changed back into civilian attire or, more accurately, business casual. After all, he had no way of knowing when Historia would come to bother him or if someone important would show up. Welcome back, replied Izuku, emerging from the master bedroom with a smile. Have you eaten? If not, there's foe in the fridge. Returning a luminous smile, Melissa revealed, I went to dinner with my papa. We had Italian food at a restaurant called Trattoria Sofia. I'm glad you were able to spend some time with your father, remarked Izuku, gesturing to the couch and adding, Do you want to talk about the conference? Though she exhaled a tired sigh, Melissa joined Izuku on the couch, snuggling up to him as she complained, People can be so dumb, Izuku. Nearly half the scientists at the conference believe we should prioritize finding a way to stabilize the breaches, not close them. Like, I understand where they're coming from, but we have enough problems trying to solve the crises of our world. Proposing to send expeditionary forces to others is no different from invading foreign lands. It's only going to make things worse. If anything, we should be trying to reach an accord with those on the other side. Nodding his head, Izuka muttered, then that's what we'll prioritize once the breaches materialize in Japan. If there are entities on the other side we can communicate with, we'll try to reason with them. If we can't, we'll focus on finding a solution to close the breaches permanently. Regaining her smile, Melissa placed her head against Izuku's shoulder and mused, I knew you'd see things the same way as Papa and me. Well, peace is always better than war. Replied Izuku, punctuating his statement with a kiss to the bubbly blonde's crown. He would have liked to do more, especially after such an irksome day, but circumstances didn't permit it. And how was your day? asked Melissa. Meet any cute girls to tour the city with. Raising her head from Izuku's shoulder, Melissa blinked cutely and asked, What's wrong? Shaking his head, Izuka revealed, I received an invitation but ultimately shot it down. I mainly just spent the day here. Adopting a slightly concerned look, Melissa asked, It wasn't because you were worried about what I would think, right? I knew what I was getting myself into when I decided to be with you, Izuku. You don't have to force or restrain yourself on my behalf. Exhaling through his nose, Izuku assured, I'm really not. I just didn't think it would be appropriate to fool around while we're on a diplomatic mission with the principal. Furrowing her brows, Melissa asked, Is that really the case? You're not just trying to put my mind at ease, are you? Though she didn't think Izuku was lying outright, Melissa's intelligence had surpassed 400 during her stay on Okinoshima. Her intuition and mental acuity had increased alongside it, so she could tell he wasn't being completely forthright. Adopting a wry smile, Izuku answered, You're right. The truth is that I'm tired of you girls seeing me as some shaboink crazed beast that can only think with his lower head. I don't need to shaboink every single girl I take an interest in. But you want to, right? Asked Melissa, adopting a gentle smile as she added, If that's the case, you should just do it. None of us are going to judge or resent you, Izuku. We love you just the way you are. Feeling that she had put Izuku on the spot, Melissa tried to lighten the mood, leaning against him and adopting a teasing smile as she added, now, tell me all about her. She must be attractive or fairly unique to have caught your attention. Though his response wasn't immediate, Izuku eventually told Melissa everything he knew about Luna, including her affiliation with the Italian Mafia. Melissa wasn't all that surprised by the latter, as a lot of Italians in New York had at least a tangential connection to the Mafia. But her brows raised quite a bit when she learned that Luna was a full heteromorph. Did you get a picture of her? Asked Melissa genuinely curious to see what Luna looked like. Shaking his head, Izuka replied no. She gave me her number and told me when she would be getting off work, but I kind of stood her up. Not intentionally, but she had the concierge call around 20 minutes after her shift ended. Oh wow, said Melissa, subsequently asking, what was her bond level before and after your encounter? You must have gotten a look at it, right? 
It was 71 the first time I looked and 88 when we parted ways, replied Izuku, recalling the information as images within his mind. And now that he said it aloud, 71 was quite high for an initial impression. Thinking the same thing as Izuku, Melissa remarked, that's pretty high. Maybe she recognized you from the UA Sports Festival? It was broadcast around the world. It's possible, admitted Izuku. But it's equally likely that she views me as a nice-looking wallet. She knows I'm visiting from another country, so she could just be aiming for my money under the guise of having a good time. Isn't that better? Asked Melissa. I know the thought of using women makes you uncomfortable, but you should be able to satisfy your curiosity and move on fairly quickly this way. Well, you're not wrong. Replied Izuku, adopting a wry smile due to the sheer ridiculousness of the conversation. He never expected Melissa, of all people, to be the one encouraging him to have a vacation fling or one-night stand. Women could be frightfully adaptive at times. Nodding her head, Melissa stated, I'm planning to accompany my father for the second day of the conference tomorrow. You should take Luna on a date and explore the city. You can't stay cooped up in your room during your first trip to the US. Though he was tempted to suggest accompanying Melissa and her father to the conference, Izuku eventually forced a smile and joked, assuming she isn't too upset about me blowing her off this afternoon. She asked you to meet her again, right? Asked Melissa. She can't be that upset. If so, you could make it up to her by buying a pendant or a pair of shoes. If she's half the gold digger you suspect her of being, that should silence any complaints she might have. Just make sure to get her photograph. I'm sure the others will want to see what she looks like. Sure. Replied Izuku, feeling like he had just been coaxed into something he had made a concerted effort to avoid. It wasn't a pleasant feeling, but at the same time, a small part of him was looking forward to the following day. At the very least, he wouldn't be stuck inside, bored out of his mind. You're here! exclaimed Luna, dressed in a distinctly different outfit from her waitress getup. In place of a white blouse, bow tie, apron and slacks, she now had on blue blocker glasses, a punk rock t-shirt, form-fitting leather pants, a stylish biker jacket, and boots. Raising his brows, Izuku asked, do you not have work today? Not exactly, replied Luna, briefly poking out her tongue before clarifying, I asked my friend Becky to cover my shift. I figured you would be busy again this afternoon, so I thought we could at least enjoy a meal together. What do you say? Since pretty much everyone from the group chat had spurred him to accompany Luna on a date, Izuku adopted a smile and replied, Sure, sounds good. Do you want to eat here or go somewhere else? Oh, can we? I know a ton of great restaurants, exclaimed Luna, linking her hand around Izuka's bicep and pressing the side of her boob against him as if it were completely natural. Nodding in affirmation, Izuka replied, so long as they aren't too far from the hotel. We could also go and see a movie. I don't have anything going on today. Really? Asked Luna, her ears and brows perking up as her bushy tail began to sway excitedly behind her. It wasn't full-on wagging, but she was clearly thrilled by the prospect of a day potentially even a night on the town. And it'll all be my treat, replied Izuku. Consider it my apology for not accompanying you yesterday afternoon. Seriously? Asked Luna. You don't need to apologize or anything. It was my bad for thinking we had agreed to meet up. Anyways, just forget about all that. Let's go have some fun. Pulling Izuku by his hand, Luna guided him to the elevator, taking it down to the employee parking area in the basement. There, she revealed to him the true reason she had on leather pants and a jacket. Rather than simply thinking they were stylish, it was because she had an actual sports bike. Ever ridden one of these bad boys? Asked Luna, presumably talking about her bright red sports bike, but it was difficult to be sure as she was bent over slightly, staring back at him with narrowed eyes. Shaking his head, Izuka replied, No, but I've thought about getting one once I get my license. Blinking in surprise, Luna rose to her full height and asked, you don't have a license? I got my learner's permit when I was 14 and my road license when I was 16. I never really needed one, replied Izuku. Japan's public transit system is the best in the world, and if I need to, I can get around faster on foot than in a vehicle. Oh? Is your superpower speed related? Asked Luna, perking up quite a bit as she added, I'm pretty fast myself, you know? My tail helps me keep my balance, even if I lean really far forward. As if to prove her point, Luna leaned over nearly 90 degrees, 
hands on her waist as she swayed her tail and hips from side to side. I can see that. Remarked Izuku, his eyes lowering to Luna's toned butt. She may have had the head of an anthropomorphic wolf, but the structure of her body was unmistakably human. What you looking at? Asked Luna, rising to her full height and turning to face Izuku with a lowered snout, upturned eyes and a playful smile. She knew exactly where Izuku had been looking, but she was curious to hear what he had to say for himself. Adopting a relaxed smile, Izuku smoothly replied, I was thinking we need to get you out of those pants and into a dress. Narrowing her eyes in amusement, Luna's smile broadened as she said, My place isn't too far from here, but I don't have nothing fancy like a proper dress. The poshest outfit I have is the one I wear for work, but that's uncomfortable like you wouldn't believe. Stretching the fabric of her t-shirt, Luna added, I prefer clothes that are comfortable and easy to move in. Even these pants. They might look like leather, but they're made from a faux super stretchy material. Then, after we finish breakfast, we'll go shopping, said Izuku. I don't mind if you want to wear casual clothes, but we might be snubbed if we try to enter a fancy restaurant. Though excited by the prospect of shopping, Luna crossed her arms, rolled her eyes, and said, Story of my life right there. Outside Piccolo Italia and the zoo, Pelosa like me aren't wanted in fancy neighborhoods and restaurants. Ignoring the metaphorical minefield that Luna had laid out for him, Izuku asked, The zoo? In a confused tone. He had heard of Piccolo Italia, Little Italy, but he had never heard of any places called the zoo. Excluding the actual zoo, of course. Eh, it's slang for the part of town where heteromorphs live, explained Luna, adding, Be careful if you ever go through there. After being treated like animals for so long, some of the residents have given up trying to act human. They give the rest of us pillows a bad rap. I take it they're not fond of, what would you call us naked apes? Asked Izuku. Ma die! Exclaimed Luna, clutching her stomach and exhaling an open-mouthed laugh before saying, You're funny Kumpa. And no, we don't call you naked apes. We call our allies Kumpa, meaning friend, and those who don't, Gabba, meaning idiot. There are some less polite words, but I don't use them. At least not for you. Punctuating her statement with a playful wink, Luna briefly turned around, grabbing her spare helmet and tossing it to Izuku as she asked, Want to try steering, or are you okay riding pillion? You're a lot bigger than me, so it might be a little awkward. Though he caught the helmet with ease, Izuku adopted a wry smile as he asked, Wouldn't it be better to take a taxi? Especially if we're planning to go shopping. Ima both. Uh, unless you dial up a premium service, ain't no taxis stopping to pick me up, said Luna. Then let's rent a car, suggested Izuku. I'm sure a hotel like the Waldorf Astoria has rental services. Oh totally, replied Luna, pointing to an area of the underground parking lot where several luxury and sports cars were located. But they're really expensive, like $4,000 a day. There's also a five to $10,000 security deposit, so it would be a lot cheaper to rent someplace else. Though he was tempted to flex his wealth, Izuku responded with a curt, give me a moment, before turning away, pulling out his cell phone, and texting Nizu. He was pretty sure their VVIP service package included a chauffeur and even a security detail, so he wanted to see if he could use it before blowing 15 grand on a rental. Assuming that Izuku was about to try and show off, Luna sat back against her bike and pulled up her left leg, resting her cheek against her knee and observing him with a smile. She was tempted to tell him he didn't need to try so hard to impress her, but she didn't want to offend or upset him. Rich people tended to enjoy spending money, so if that's what Izuku wanted to do, she didn't mind indulging him. She just wanted to have fun with a cute, pleasant-smelling foreigner. Turning back to Luna, Izuku asked, Are you okay with having someone chauffeur us around, or would you prefer to drive? That's up to you, replied Luna, narrowing her eyes slightly as she added, It could be fun to ride in the back of a limo and sip on some champagne. We'll consider that for this evening, said Izuku sending his response to Nizu as he added, It's a bit early to be drinking. That's probably for the best, mused Luna, adopting a playful smile as she revealed, Don't tell anyone, but I'm a bit of a lightweight. I also tend to get clingy, so you've been warned. I'll keep that in mind, replied Izuku, returning a smile as he placed his cell phone into his breast pocket. Less than a minute later, a man dressed as a hotel employee showed up, carrying with him a bunch of keys as he practically ran over. Oh hey Thomas, said Luna, raising her hand and performing a casual wave. Though he briefly cast an incredulous look toward Luna, Thomas's main focus was Izuku, forcing a smile as nervously as he presented the keys and said, 
Your keys, sir. Shaking his head, Izuka thumbed toward Luna, saying, let the lady choose. I don't have a license. Right. Replied Thomas, shifting his attention to Luna as he asked, which car would you like to drive, ma'am? Do I really get to choose? Asked Luna, moving next to Izuku and staring up at him with excitement in her luminous golden eyes. Go ahead, replied Izuku. My package includes free vehicle rentals, so you have your pick of the litter. No pun intended. Turning her eyes up, Luna muttered, Ma die. Before snatching one of the sets of keys from Thomas and darting over to a car that looked more like a spaceship than a road-faring vehicle. In fact, Izuku was positive he had seen a similar model with rotary wings. Alleviating Thomas's paling complexion, Izuku gave the man a firm pat on the shoulder as he said, Thanks for the quick service. I'll be sure to send you a gratuity payment later. Regaining a practiced smile, Thomas replied, T thank you sir. If you need anything else during your stay, please don't hesitate to ask for me by name. I'll consider it, said Izuku, retracting his hand from Thomas's shoulder and following after Luna. She looked like a kid that had just received a go-kart for their birthday, but instead of a boxcar, the vehicle she was about to drive easily cost more than half a million dollars. Hurry up and get in, exclaimed Luna, waiting in the driver's seat with an unfettered smile and wide excited eyes. Yeah yeah I'm coming, replied Izuku, ducking his head to avoid hitting it on the slanted scissor door. This was ultimately unnecessary, as the car was made to accommodate much larger individuals, but he had smacked his head on a similar door in his past life. It looks even more like a spaceship inside. Remarked Izuku, settling into the remarkably comfortable passenger's seat, seemingly made from some kind of memory foam material. As for why he had commented on the interior, it was because the dash panel was entirely digital, framed by Tron-like lights. If that's your reaction, you're gonna love this, said Luna, inserting the key into the ignition and turning it. As she did, the dashboard came to life as the previously clear windows tinted making the car's interior dark and atmospheric. At the same time, the seat Izuku was seated in seemed to conform even further to his body as it simultaneously moved back a little, giving him more legroom. Pointing to the display on his side, Luna said, Check it out, full biometric data. The computer system can sense if you're sick, intoxicated, or injured and automatically take over, driving you home or to the hospital. With this puppy, we don't even need a chauffeur. I take it that you like cars, asked Izuku. Do, replied Luna. I don't know how it is over in Japan, but here in New York, every man, woman, and child has dreamed of owning a car like this. It's a status symbol, especially for those who feel they have something to prove. Well, it's ours for the next couple of days, replied Izuku. Feel free to put some miles on it. Oh, definitely, replied Luna, adopting a smile that showed off her sharp teeth as she mused. Did you see the look on Thomas's face? He's going to be sick to his stomach when he reads the odometer. The hotel gets to charge more if the car doesn't have a lot of miles on it. Don't do anything that might jeopardize your job or career, said Izuku. There is an old adage that says you only live once, but it's best not to compromise yourself just to have some fun. Raising her brows, Luna turned to Izuku and remarked, that's a pretty responsible thing to say. Just how old are you? 16, replied Izuku the corners of his smile curling upward when Luna's eyes widened in surprise. It was impossible for him to tell her age based on her appearance, but he suspected she was around 23 to 25, since she had previously informed him she was close to getting her master's in finance and economics. Recovering from her stupor, Luna adopted a wry smile and scratched her cheek as she admitted, Wow, I was way off. I thought you were at least 20. I get that, replied Izuku. People have always told me I was mature for my age. If you don't mind my asking, how old are you? I turned 23 in March. Replied Luna, a conflicted look developing across her face as she faced forward and lowered her gaze, seemingly in deep thought. Seven years wasn't an insurmountable age gap compared to some celebrities, but she suddenly felt like she was taking advantage of a raging teen with more money than sense. Catching Luna a little off guard, Izuku said, We don't need to shaboink. To be honest, one of the reasons I didn't meet up with you yesterday is because I thought I had given you the wrong idea. If you just want to see a movie and hang out, I'm more than down. Passing the buck back to Izuku, it was Luna's turn to surprise him by stating, but I kind of want to, in a questioning tone, scratching the back of her head and smiling awkwardly as she added, your scent got me really riled up yesterday, 
so I think we have good compatibility. What's your sign, by the way? Mine's Pisces. Ah. Uh, cancer, replied Izuku, not entirely sure as he had never looked it up. See, said Luna. Cancer and Pisces have amazing compatibility. Let's just pretend I didn't ask for your age, and if anyone else does, tell them you're 20. You certainly look it. Though he got the impression Luna was forcing herself, Izuka responded with a relaxed shrug and replied, Sounds good. Just don't be afraid to change your mind. I didn't choose the name Paragon because I believe I'm perfect and without flaws. It's because I want to become someone who can inspire others. Noting the sincerity in Izuku's expression and tone, Luna regained her usual smile asserting, You treat others well, even if they're different than you. I'm sure you'll make a great hero someday. For now however, you're playing the part of my compagno, my companion. Raising his brows, Izuka remarked, I'm pretty sure compagno means something else. Narrowing her eyes and adopting a surprisingly alluring smile, Luna teased, Well it's not wrong. As she positioned her hand over the manual transmission and caressed the knob, all without breaking eye contact. After getting a bite to eat at a restaurant close to the Waldorf Astoria, Izuku and Luna hit up the largest mall in New York, a truly monstrous monument to capitalism known as the World Central Mall. While the rest of the world was in a state of crisis, most Americans didn't even consider the meta-world transversal phenomenon a serious threat. For them, it was someone else's problem an event that would have been utterly unrelated to them if not for the fact it pumped up the cost of food, energy, and imported electronics. This place is packed. Remarked Izuku, genuinely awed by how many people were moving about the seven-story, 5.2 million square foot, 1,373 store mall. Of course it is, exclaimed Luna. People come from all over the world to visit the World Central Mall. It's a major tourist attraction. I can see that. Remarked Izuku, his eyes feeling a little dry and fatigued from inspecting too many people. He wasn't particularly curious about the mass of people walking around, but there were a ton of costumed heroes within the mall, some on patrol and others taking a break. Seeing Izuku massage his eyes, Luna asked, You good Kumpa? Not used to being around a lot of people. Shaking his head, Izuku replied, Japan is still rebuilding its population in the wake of the Quirk Wars. It gets crowded in the metropolitan areas, but never quite like this. There's a park and greenhouse center on the top floor, said Luna. Want to check it out? I'm not really tired, replied Izuku. Let's just go where you want to go. I should be fine once we get into an actual store. Eh, I'm fine with heading back to the car, said Luna. I'm saving up to move into a new apartment once I graduate, so I didn't come here to do any shopping. Take enough business and finance courses, and you learn quickly that purchasing things in-store is pretty wasteful. What if I offered to pay for everything? Asked Izuku, adopting a faint, fearless smile. Narrowing her eyes, Luna replied, My mama and babo didn't raise me to be dependent on others. If you want to spend money on me, that's on you, Kumpa. I'm just here to have fun. Then let's find something out for your parents, replied Izuku, adding, And anyone else you happen to be close to. I imagine you have a pretty big family. Six brothers and eight sisters, replied Luna. I'm the third oldest, but I have twin sisters named Luna and Neve. Blinking in surprise, Izuku asked, you're a triplet? Technically, replied Luna, scratching her cheek as she clarified, it's common for the girls in my family to have two to three kids at a time. I was born alongside my two sisters, but we look nothing alike. Luna has gray fur like my babo and Neves is pure white. Ah. Disappointed? Asked Luna, giving Izuku a playful punch in her arm as she teased, don't be greedy. You don't even know if you can handle one DeLuca girl. If we all sank our teeth into you, there wouldn't be any meat left on your bone. Though he was tempted to ask if she was speaking from experience, Izuku guided the conversation to the original topic, asking, so where to? Want to pick your mom out a necklace or something? Sure. But it shouldn't be too pricey, replied Luna. If I return with a bunch of expensive presents and jewelry, my parents might think you're trying to buy their favor. I won't get into the reasons why, but things might become difficult for you if that happens. Let's just say my extended family doesn't mesh well with heroic types. Pretending he had no idea what Luna was referring to, Izuku maintained a relaxed smile as he teased. You'll be the one choosing the gifts, so it's on you if there are any misunderstandings. I'm just doing what I can to make this a day to remember. 
Adopting a narrow-eyed smile, Luna grabbed Azuka's arm, musing sure. And in exchange, I'll give you a night you won't forget. Before licking his cheek. As the more expensive, name-brand stores were located on the upper levels, Izuku and Luna made their way up to the sixth floor of the mall, passing through a series of scanners as they went. Assuming that Izuku didn't know what the scanners were for, Luna explained, America uses a social credit system where your ID is linked to your bank account, digital profile, and other personal information. If you have a dangerous quirk, a criminal record, or carry an unregistered weapon or support tool, the elevator will stall until people from the Public Security Bureau show up to chaperone you. As if in response to Luna's words, the elevator abruptly came to a stop, followed by the lights dimming a digital strip around the roof displaying the words, for your safety and well-being, please remain calm and follow the instructions of the Public Security Bureau. Thank you. Raising her brows, Luna looked to Izuku and asked, are you carrying? Or is your quirk something dangerous? Adopting an awkward smile, Izuku rubbed the back of his head as he revealed, I'm wearing my hero costume and a few unregistered support items. Madai. Muttered Luna, smacking her forehead. She knew that Izuku was a hero. At the very least, she believed him when he told her he was one. However, if it turned out he didn't have a license or a permit to carry and operate the support tools he was wearing, things would become very troublesome very quickly. Relax. It won't be an issue, asserted Izuku, adopting a calm and relaxed demeanor. Sure, most of his support items weren't registered, but Melissa had filed the necessary patents through a subordinate company of Shield Labs. His name was on the Registry of Heroes authorized to field test their equipment, and according to Nizu, he had limited immunity and approval from the governor to act as a hero within the Manhattan city limits. Seeing Izuku's confidence, Luna narrowed her eyes and mused, Okay, Mr. Big Shot. But if we get arrested, you get to explain to my babo how his baby girl ended up in a holding cell. Sure thing, replied Izuku, maintaining his composure as the message system informed them a representative from the Public Security Bureau had arrived and to take a step back. The standard procedure was to turn around and place their hands against the wall, so Luna's brows perked up quite a bit when the doors parted, revealing a bespectacled woman in a power suit and an incredibly athletic-looking man with a hero costume consisting of a black bodysuit with a yellow arrow pattern adorning his broad chest, back, shoulders, and legs. Recognizing the man immediately, Luna's eyes widened as she muttered, Vector Hero, Force Maxim. Name, Timothy Adams Title Party Invitation Required Quirk, Vector Bond Level, 44 Current Level, 47 Effective Level, 69, Attributes Strength, 78 Agility, 43 Vitality, 193 Intelligence, 71 Dexterity, 68 Luck, 241 Free Attributes, 235 Perks. Party Invitation Required. Contrasting Luna's worry, Izuka thought, weak. Even though Force Maxim's quirk was fairly useful, allowing him to arrest the momentum of objects with his hands and feet and use it to empower his strikes. The caveat was that he couldn't absorb and discharge energy at the same time, so if he were forced to endure a continuous assault, his body would rapidly heat up. Name, Amanda Riviera title party invitation required quirk, pathokinesis bond level, 51 current level, 23 effective level, 28, attributes strength, 14 agility, 16 vitality, 71 intelligence, 93 dexterity, 25 luck, 67 free attributes, 115 perks party invitation required. This one is a lot more dangerous, thought Izuku. Pathokinesis was the ability to read and manipulate emotions, so it could be a powerful tool for both good and evil, allowing the user to pacify and rile people up with a touch. Wearing a professional business-like smile, the bespectacled intelligent-looking brunette said, Please be at ease. Neither of you is in any kind of trouble. Rather, when our scanners identified you, my supervisor couldn't believe you were walking around without an escort. Directing her gaze at Izuku, the brunette Amanda, adopted a troubled smile as she added, The PSP would be in quite the pickle if something were to happen to you on our watch. Furrowing his brows, Izuku pointed out, We draw more attention with you chaffering us around. Also, if you're aware of my identity, you know I'm more than capable of protecting myself. Tell your supervisor that their concern is unwarranted, and more importantly, unwanted. Maintaining her smile, Amanda shifted her attention to Luna as she stated, We would comply under ordinary circumstances, but the identity of your companion makes things difficult. She may not have a criminal record, but she is a known associate dash raising his hand, Izuku said, I'm going to have to stop you right there. Get your supervisor on the phone or bring them over to me. While you do, 
I'll be placing a call to the governor. Losing a bit of her friendliness, Amanda's smile cramped as she said, I don't believe it's necessary to get the governor involved. We just want to ensure Dash enough, said Izuku, exuding an invisible pressure that caused Force Maxim to step forward, hands raised in a placating gesture as he said, Whoa now. Let's not do anything rash, okay, kiddo? No need to make a scene. You're absolutely right, said Izuku. Yet, here you are, making a scene over nothing. Pulling out his cell phone, Izuku was prepared to dial up Nizu when Luna abruptly hugged his arm, whispering, Let's just get out of here. There are plenty of jewelry and clothing stores elsewhere. We don't need to waste our time with these stronzos, bastards. Though he felt obligated to pursue the matter, Izuku didn't want to put Luna on the spot. Thus, after a moment of deliberation and a judgmental glower at the duo of Amanda and Force Maxim, Izuku turned to Luna and replied, If that's what you want, that's what we'll do. With Luna nodding her head, Izuku directed his gaze back to Amanda, regaining his glower as he asked, You don't have a problem with that, do you? Of course not, replied Amanda, forcing a smile despite cursing her supervisor in her mind. She could tell at a glance that Izuku wouldn't let this matter go, so she was almost guaranteed to be thrown under the bus, even though she had only been following orders. With Amanda and Force Maxim allowing them to go, Izuku and Luna rode the elevator down to the first floor, departing the mall and returning to the car. Luna had a conflicted look the entire way, but before she could find the words to apologize, Izuku surprised her by saying, I'm sorry you had to go through that. Recovering from a momentary daze, Luna adopted a sad smile, shaking her head as she said, It's fine. I've experienced much worse. Besides, I appreciate how you stood up for me. Shifting her gaze to Izuku, Luna's smile regained its vigor as she mused. That chick with the glasses totally pissed herself when you flared up at her. I almost feel sorry for her. Shaking his head, Izuku grimaced as he said, You shouldn't. Anyone that can look at another person like that is undeserving of sympathy. Shrugging her shoulders, Luna casually remarked, Not everyone sees us as people. I think that's what initially drew me to you. You may have had a perverted glimmer in your eyes, but you're not like those furry nut jobs or the perverts that pick up prostitutes near the zoo. Leaning toward Izuku, Luna closed her eyes and gave him a sniff, adding, You also smell really good. If I didn't know better, I would think you were wearing a pheromone spray to try and trigger me. Attempting to lighten the mood even further, Izuku joked, Nope. This is my natural musk. Pretty manly, isn't it? It smells kind of sweet, replied Luna, drawing even closer to Izuku so she could sniff him more intently. It was a little awkward, and her nose was cold, but Izuku didn't mind it until she started to lick the underside of his ear. Luna? Called out Izuku, his voice carrying an awkward undertone and a wry smile developing across his face. Pulling away momentarily, Luna asked, Do you not like me licking you? I don't really do kissing. Shaking his head, Izuku replied, It's fine. You just caught me a little off guard, that's all. Then can I continue? Asked Luna her golden eyes glistening hungrily in the low light of the car's interior. When Izuku eventually nodded his head, she resumed licking him earnestly, her surprisingly long and rough tongue lapping up the remnants of his dried sweat as she gradually shifted to his side of the car. Though it was a little awkward, Izuku enjoyed the experience of Luna lapping up his sweat as she sat atop his lap, willfully grinding her crotch against his bulge. Unfortunately, just a few minutes into their impromptu make-out session, a loud knock emanated from the driver's side window, the result of someone trying to break into their car. Seriously. Groaned Izuku, prompting Luna to exhale a soft but throaty chuckle, licking his cheek one final time before remarking, I told you we should have parked in a closed security lot. As Luna moved back to her seat, Izuku pressed the button that caused the window's tint to fade, revealing a trio of relatively young-look people with custom balaclavas to match the contours of their faces. Not expecting anyone to be in the car they were trying to break into, the trio immediately bolted in different directions. One even leaped high into the sky, bounding several tens of meters before spreading his arms like a flying squirrel to glide away. Deterring Izuku from giving chase, Luna remarked, Madai. At this point, I'm starting to think it would be best if we just got a hotel to relax. I have an Amazon Flix account, so we can just stream an already released movie if you'd like. Returning his gaze to Luna, Izuku asked, What about buying presents? Narrowing her eyes slightly, Luna practically purred, You're not very good at reading between the lines, Kumpa. Ah. Seeing Luna shift in her seat, staring at him unblinkingly with her luminous golden eyes, 
A wry smile developed across Azuka's face. She was clearly very agitated, but because of the attempted break-in, his excitement had transitioned to alertness. Adopting a more relaxed posture, Izuku pointed out, you're in the driver's seat. Wherever we end up, I'm sure I'll enjoy the ride. Narrowing her eyes further, Luna quickly keyed an address into the car's navigation panel before returning to Izuku's side of the vehicle. As much as she wanted to give the supercar a spin, she was too distracted to drive it personally. Thus, while the car smoothly and expertly navigated them to their destination, she instinctually covered every inch of Izuku's face and neck with her scent. After leaving the rental in a high-security parking lot that stored vehicles deep underground using a special conveyor elevator, Izuku accompanied Luna to a small but expensive studio apartment whose main bedroom was barely 2.5 x 4 m. The bed, located at the far end of the room, touched both walls, but even at a glance, it had a lot of character. Framed vinyl records lined both walls, and there were signed photos of famous jazz musicians and rock bands from over a hundred years prior. Before Izuku could comment on the framed records, Luna slipped past him to grab an open, nearly full laundry hamper, placing it inside a small closet before turning to face him with an awkward smile as she said, It's probably not as fancy as the hotels and rooms you're used to, but this is my home away from home. Sorry if it smells a little funky. Though he couldn't tell if she was blushing, Izuku imagined Luna's cheeks glowing crimson as he inhaled a deep breath through his nose. A fairly prominent fragrance lingered in the air, but rather than smelling like a wet canine or something foul, it was similar to roasted chestnuts mixed with a deep feminine aroma. It's not a bad smell. Remarked Izuku, prompting Luna to exhale a sigh of relief before crossing her arms to stare at him with a playfully pointed look as she muttered, You really know how to put a girl on edge. Without waiting for Izuku's response, Luna uncrossed her arms and approached him, fearlessly unbuttoning the buttons of his dress shirt to reveal part of his hero costume as she narrowed her eyes and muttered, You know, green is one of my favorite colors. That would explain a lot. Replied Izuku, surprising Luna as he casually reached behind her and moved his hand along the underside of her soft fluffy tail. He couldn't imagine how much shampoo and conditioner she went through, but she clearly cared for the quality of her fur. Leaning into Izuku, Luna wrapped her arms around his body and snapped her teeth playfully, remarking, I didn't bring you here to pet me and fluff up my tail. Moving away from Izuku, Luna grabbed his wrists and pulled him toward her bed, releasing him at the last moment to fall backward onto its pillowy surface. Then with her tail curled up between her legs, the tip extending to cover the lower half of her face, she ran her hands along its surface and mused, though I can understand why you'd want to. So, I take it we're skipping the movie? Asked Izuku, unfastening the final few buttons of his dress shirt while Luna observed him with a hungry glimmer in her eyes. While continuing to caress her tail, Luna responded, I'm too riled up right now. Once I've calmed down, we can watch a movie, visit the park, or just take a nap. Seeing Izuku remove his shirt and discard the upper half of his green and black hero costume, Luna's eyes widened. Many heroes disguised their true physiques with muscle suits and padding. She could tell Izuku was in great shape, but his clearly defined muscles caught her off guard, causing her heart to tense as her already heated breathing accelerated. Saving Izuku the effort, Luna kicked off her custom-made shoes and began to shimmy out of her pants as if they were stockings. As Luna affectionately licked the sweat from his neck and the side of his face with her somewhat rough tongue, Izuku stared up at the ceiling with a contented smile. Some would invariably call him a furry now that he had slept with a heteromorph, but even if he had the option to go back in time, he would just use it to shaboink Luna even sooner. How can you taste and smell so good? Asked Luna, her voice low and husky as she added, I haven't felt this aroused since I went into heat for the first time. Well don't hold back on my account. Izuka replied, turning to face Luna and drawing their bodies closer together. She snuggled up to him as he did so, but while she was certainly aroused, Luna's response was a faint, maybe in a bit. For now, I just want you to hold me. As she nestled her face between his neck and shoulder. Sure. Replied Izuku, his voice gentle and soothing as he embraced the remarkably warm wolf girl. He felt an almost overwhelming compulsion to caress her back and tail, but since she had specifically asked him to hold her, that was all he did. VZZZT 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 is that you or me? Asked Luna, her tail thumping in mild frustration. She wasn't angry at Izuku, but she was the type that, once she got nice and cozy, hated having to move. I'm pretty sure it's you, replied Izuku, seizing the initiative to grab Luna's phone with his black whip before bringing it around to his back. 
Luna was slightly startled by the sudden appearance of shadowy tendrils, but since Izuku had brought her phone right in front of her face, she quickly swiped it open to see who had messaged her. Oh darn it! hissed Luna, separating from Izuku, rising with a start, and snatching her phone. Then while rapidly sending a text, she practically growled, K maledetti stronzi. Gli ho detto di smetterla di intromettersi nella mia vita. Though he was tempted to ask if everything was okay, Izuku elected to prop his head up by his hand and elbow and just watch Luna frustratedly type away. Everyone had secrets and personal matters they didn't want others butting into, so he waited until Luna finished typing before asking, I'm guessing nap time's over? Exhaling an exasperated sigh, Luna massaged her head in frustration and explained, It was a message from my idiot brother. Someone sent him a picture of us, so he's threatening to come over and teach you a lesson if I don't chase you out. He sounds like a real classy fellow, mused Izuku, unconcerned with the possibility he might be beaten. Luna's familial ties were certainly a reason for pause, but if he were concerned with being a target, he wouldn't have agreed to go on a date, much less shaboink her. Exhaling a soft chuckle, Luna regained a bit of her vigor as she turned to face Izuku, smiling as she replied, He might be a bastard, but he's still my brother. If you do end up fighting, go easy on him for me, would you? It would be a whole thing if you were to put him in the hospital. That depends on him, but I'll try not to do anything that would upset you, said Izuku, rising to a seated position. Luna leaned over and licked his lips in response, but while he was slightly and a little taken aback by the sudden and peculiar form of intimacy, Izuku didn't recoil. Instead, he smiled and remarked, I thought you didn't do kissing? That was clearly a lick, Luna retorted, narrowing her eyes and smiling as she leaned closer. With any other woman, Izuku would have interpreted her actions as an offer to make out. But since Luna didn't have the proper mouth structure, he reached his hand to caress her cheek but stopped as she grabbed his forearm and began licking his fingers and palm, all while staring at him with her moon glow eyes. You really enjoy licking don't you? asked Izuku, adopting a somewhat cheeky smile. And then. And I'd like to keep licking you but we don't really have time replied Luna, moving Izuku's hand to her melon and allowing him to cop a feel as she softly, somewhat somberly, appended, I wanted to spend more time with you, but things will get out of hand if you stick around. Let's just treat this little rendezvous of ours as a chance encounter. A fling fated never to bear fruit. And what if I decided otherwise? Asked Izuku, moving his hand from Luna's melon and running it down the side of her body. Exhaling a soft chuckle, Luna leaned her face closer to Izuku's and asked, Then what would you do, kidnap me and keep me in your closet back at the hotel? I do have a bit of a kink for being tied up. Before Izuku could answer, Luna pulled away from him, rising from the bed and stretching her body as she said, We should hurry. I'll ride with you back to the hotel, and then you can raw dog me in the rental before we return the keys. That will at least end things on a high note and give me something to laugh about whenever I see Thomas. If that's what you want, that's what we'll do, replied Izuku, smiling as he caught the briefs Luna tossed at his face. If he were being completely honest, a part of him wanted to keep the charming wolf girl, but since she wasn't a pet, and he was supposed to be trying to avoid additions to his harem, he decided to let matters take their course. Sometimes, things simply didn't work, but before they parted ways, Izuku was determined to ensure Luna never forgot him. Though the windows of his suite were just displays, Izuku found himself staring out them with his hands behind his back and a relaxed smile that belied the slight panic he was experiencing. He had fully and completely planned to sever ties with Luna at her own suggestion. But after receiving the most thorough shabowinking of her life, the heteromorphic wolf girl was now sleeping in his bed. Well, it's not like I could have just left her lying unconscious in the car. Thought Izuku, recalling the scene of Luna laughing in an incoherent daze as she lay belly up with her legs bent and hands raised in a begging pose. He tried bringing her back to her senses, but she just kept trying to lick and nuzzle him until she eventually passed out from a sudden nosebleed. Feeling his phone vibrate in his interior breast pocket, Izuku pulled it out and saw that it was a message from Nizu asking if he had kidnapped the daughter of the DeLuca family's patriarch. Regardless, about a dozen of their top-ranking remembers had attempted to enter the hotel, searching for him and Luna. The security unsurprisingly had no problem dissuading them from making a scene but Izuku was strongly advised to stay in and not order Italian food. I suppose this is better than a closet. Came the voice of Luna, having awoken several minutes prior but choosing to remain silent as, even now, she was still basking in the afterglow of Izuku's intense lovemaking. She seriously doubted it, but his apparent attempt to knock her up compelled her to think he might have fallen for her. Are you okay? Asked Izuku, turning to face Luna with visible concern. 
While it was true he had intended to give her an experience she wouldn't soon, if ever forget, he didn't intend to mind break her. Oh trust me I'm spectacular replied Luna, caressing her abdomen and narrowing her eyes as she mused. My legs are a little numb, but I got the impression back in the car that you didn't want me going anywhere. Adopting a faint smile, Izuka remarked, well we did plan to spend the evening together. But before anything else, you should call your parents. Some of your extended family came around and nearly got into a scuffle with security. Sure, I'll call them, but only if you come over and massage my legs and butt. Said Luna, rolling onto her belly, crossing her arms under her chin, and staring back at Izuku with sultry eyes. Her legs really were numb, but she mainly wanted to see if he would show the same intrigue now that he had experienced her so completely. Fortunately for Luna, Izuku was fairly adept at reading between the lines, his smile gaining a wolfish undertone as he said, It took me ten minutes to get you into those pants, but if you insist, I wouldn't mind taking them off to help with circulation. Then grab my phone and get over here, big boy. Mused Luna, her voice low and husky as her coochie tightened and throbbed hungrily. She usually only felt this way from late winter to early spring, but Izuku's actions had inadvertently induced her estrus. There were pills she could take to offset the symptoms, but after what he had done to her in the car, Luna craved much more. And as the one liable for her condition, who better than Izuku to take responsibility? Okay, I talked to my mama, and she convinced my babo to call off the goon squad, said Luna. However, as she had been lying atop Izuku, using his body as a recliner, he knew without her having to tell him. That's good, but I don't think I'll be able to accept their dinner invitation, replied Izuku his hands resting on Luna's belly. Yeah, that's probably for the best, said Luna, leaning her head back and nudging Izuka's chin as she added, I haven't told them you're a hero, but the bigger issue is your age. My mama always told me and my sisters to avoid dating younger men. She would tan my hide and hang it out to dry if she learned the dignitary who whisked me away to his private hotel room was six years my junior. Lucky for me, you look much older and dress the part. I'm definitely not your average high school hero in training muttered Izuku, bringing his right hand up to caress Luna's throat. She had said he could pet her as much as he wanted, so when she angled her head back, he couldn't resist scratching under her chin. Are you trying to rile me up? asked Luna, closing her eyes slightly as she enjoyed having the underside of her neck and chin scratched quite a bit. She preferred her belly and the inside of her thighs rubbed, but if they kept shabowinking as they had been, she might ask Izuku for a collar. Instead of answering Luna's question, Izuku continued massaging her throat, asking, Now that you have permission to stay the night, is there anything you want to do? Food, replied Luna, playfully licking Izuku's nose before teasing, You might have stuffed me like a turkey, but I'm practically ravenous. Got anything to eat in this overpriced palace? I don't really feel like getting dressed or going out. MMM. It's probably best to avoid walking around naked, said Izuku, preempting Luna's playful response by pointing out, Due to the summit, there are a lot of people paying attention to this place, many making use of high-end surveillance equipment and Quirk specialized in monitoring and gathering information. As much as I'd love to see your perky behind and tail swaying about the suite completely naked or wearing a baggy t-shirt, we shouldn't lower our guards. Rolling onto her stomach and licking Izuka's chin, Luna mused, I almost forgot how much of a big shot you were. Would it? Cause you problems to be seen with me? It would, but I couldn't care less what most people think about me said Izuku. With this whole MWT phenomenon going on, I have infinitely more important shit to think about. Shaking his head, Izuku slid his hands down Luna's but, squeezing it and pulling her closer as he added, more than myself, I'm worried about you. I don't doubt that you can take care of yourself, but there are a lot of evil, powerful and opportunistic bastards in this world. You're preaching to the choir, Kumpa. Replied Luna, rubbing her cheek against Izuku's as her hot breath tickled his ear. As a daughter of the De Luca crime family, she was no stranger to peril, villains, and the so-called justice system. However, as her babo had always told her that politicians were the most dangerous, two-faced criminals on planet Earth, she didn't completely disregard Izuku's warning. Once they were done nuzzling one another, she squeezed into her pants and a t-shirt before they made their way to the kitchen to scavenge for food, the absence of which compelled them to order room service. While Izuku was in the middle of hand-feeding Luna hoarders she could usually only stare at, Melissa was poutily nursing a frappuccino in the back of a heavily armored limousine with her father, the latter making use of his squirmy fingers quirk to type rapidly on a laptop whose projected display could only be seen with special lenses. You shouldn't let what happened at the conference bother you, said David, 
a weary smile developing across his face as he added, Sadly, it's almost always been the case that the interests of a few dictate the course of human history. Just as you're eager to research the materials found in the breaches, those in positions of power are frantic to capitalize on them before their enemies can. We can't even fairly manage the resources of our own world. Melissa muttered. It's absurd to think we have the means to share and regulate the resources of others. With how many lives have already been lost to the meta-world transversal phenomenon, those that dare to suggest we leave them open should be detained and thrown in prison. Raising his gaze from his invisible display, David's expression softened as he remarked, you're starting to remind me of your mother. She too, had a profound distaste for politics and the influence capitalism has on global trade and international policy. Feeling happy and sad at being compared to her mother, a faint nostalgic smile developed across Melissa's face. Before she could offer a response however, a startled scream escaped her throat as their limousine abruptly came to a stop. Fortunately, while her inertia carried her forward, causing her a bit of pain and discomfort, her seatbelt prevented her from lurching ahead like her father's laptop. Are you okay? Shouted David, removing his own seatbelt to move over and check on Melissa. I'm fine, Melissa replied, unbuckling her seatbelt and rubbing her sore chest as she asked, what happened? That's an excellent question. I don't believe we crashed, said David, pulling out a white glove with a blue circuit-like pattern stitched into it and slipping it onto his left hand. As he did so, an augmented reality HUD appeared in his glasses as dozens of tiny drones separated from the self-driving limo to ascertain the situation. Seeing what the drones saw, a moderately bemused huh. Escaped David's throat, prompting Melissa to ask, What is it? Was there a traffic accident? Take a look, said David, making a sweeping gesture that caused his HUD to appear in Melissa's glasses, allowing her to see what he saw. Oh. Muttered Melissa, her eyes widening in mild confusion as a purple vortex, identical to some of the ones shown in photos and videos during the conference, appeared in the middle of the street. Similar phenomena were observed before breaches materialized in other countries. However, as it was estimated that America's first breaches wouldn't appear until the end of the year, she couldn't help feeling a little confused. While Melissa was still in awe, David activated the limousine's emergency protocol, causing the wheels outside to turn into hover jets and ferry them to safety as the vortex outside continued to expand, eventually taking up the entire street and devouring parts of the buildings flanking it. Inorganic matter, excluding the clothes and articles on a person's body, was broken down the moment the vortex enveloped it. As for the people themselves, those unfortunate enough to be within the vortexes. Emergence zone were pulled into the forthcoming breach's interior, unharmed but trapped inside until it had fully formed and stabilized. VZZT VZZT VZZT, that's definitely you this time. Said Luna, lying across Azuka's lap as he caressed her post-meal paunch. When you're right, you're right. Replied Azuku, pulling out his cell phone to see what the emergency was. He had set it to silent after sending the girls a selfie that included Luna licking his sideburn, so if it was vibrating, that meant someone was sending a high-priority message. Oh, well that's not good. Muttered Azuku prompting Luna's brows to perk as she asked, What's up? Are some bastard villains robbing a bank or something? Apparently, one of those breaches that have been appearing in the news has emerged a few kilometers from here. Revealed Izuku, his expression and tone calm despite the gears in his mind spinning in overdrive. He had no reason to doubt the accuracy of the information, as it came from Nizu by way of Melissa and her father. However, as the early emergence of a breach in the US indicated that their forecasts for Japan were functionally meaningless, a wave of chilling anxiety washed over Izuku as the image of his mother, Eri, the girls, and a pregnant Rumi appeared in his mind. As if he could read Izuku's thoughts, Mizu promptly sent a follow-up text telling him not to worry as there were few safer places in the entire world than the campus of UA, and that was before the emergence of the MWT phenomenon. Now, it had even stricter security than a nuclear missile silo and the Tartarus Supermax prison. While Luna observed him in silence, Izuku asked Nizu what, if anything, he should do. In response, the ever-reliable cat mouse dog told him that the best thing he could do was take care of his present company. Local heroes and the National Guard were already establishing a cordon around the breach, so even if he were to head over, he would be barred passage as the US had no intention of allowing external forces to enter the breach before their own. Responding in the affirmative and asking Nizu to keep him posted, Izuku set aside his phone, sighed, and resumed rubbing Luna's belly, prompting her to ask, You good, Kumpa? 
Instead of immediately answering Luna's question, Izuku held her yellow-eyed gaze in silence, enjoying the tactile sensation of her fur against his palm before, rather abruptly, asking, Do you trust me? Asking a question like that out of the blue is a massive red flag, replied Luna, grabbing Izuka's hand and guiding it to her lower abdomen as she smiled and added, But yes, I trust you, Campagno. I may not know much of substance about you, but there are two things I'm absolutely certain of. Want to hear them? Seeing Izuku nod, Luna took a moment to lick her front teeth and canines before teasing. You have a big dong but an even bigger heart. There were a lot of ways I imagined today going, but I never once considered I would actually fall for you before it ended. You're saying that even after I told you about all the girls I'm involved with back home? Asked Izuku, raising his brows in disbelief even as he took the initiative to slip his hand into Luna's pants. I mean it says a lot that you're actually able to make things work with such numerous women. Replied Luna, her chest beginning to heave and her breathing becoming increasingly audible as Izuku put his dexterous fingers to work. In truth, she wasn't completely certain of her feelings, but the more time she spent with Izuku, the more she realized he was a figure who should have been far beyond her reach. And that, if she were being completely honest, kind of irked her. Then I'm going to trust you as well. Said Izuku, leaning his face down as if he were going for a kiss but stopping short. When Luna licked him in response, he sank his middle finger into her coochie, gently stimulating her insides as he began explaining the bare bones of his digitalization quirk and the many benefits it could provide. Seeing the selfie Izuku had sent through the group chat, a slight frown marred Rumi's face as she lay in her bed, completely naked except for a belly warmer. Rabbits and wolves didn't exactly mix, but the main reason for her frustration was that she wasn't the one beside him. This baby needs to hurry up and come. Rumi muttered, her expression and tone exuding annoyance, but if one were to look close, they would be able to discern a glimmer of affection in her usually fierce carmine eyes as she caressed her lower abdomen. She still regarded herself as a hero and a warrior through and through, but as the life within her belly continued to grow, Rumi began to feel that she could be much more. Hurry back, you damn bastard. Izuku I'm back back, exclaimed Melissa, entering Izuku's suite without the secret service outside trying to stop her. A few moments later, Izuku emerged from the master bedroom shirtless, smiling as he said, welcome back. Though her eyes glistened when she saw Izuku's exceptionally sculpted form, Melissa stopped short of complimenting it when Luna emerged from the master bedroom behind him, an awkward smile adorning her face as she rubbed the back of her head and offered a tentative hey. You must be Melissa. I'm Luna. Recovering from her mental pause, Melissa's eyes glistened even more intensely as she adopted a broad smile and remarked, wow, you're even cuter in person. I can see why Izuku took an interest in you. Mind if I feel your fur? Ah, uh, sure, replied Luna, extending her hand as Melissa approached. She was initially nervous to learn that one of Izuku's women was the daughter of David Shield, but seeing Melissa in person, Luna got the impression she was a bit of a dork. She was friendly, beautiful, and wealthier than anyone had the right to be, but she probably felt more at home with her gadgets than people. Grabbing Luna's outstretched hand and rubbing the bristly yet smooth fur along her forearm, Melissa asked, What's it like to be covered in fur? And if it isn't too intrusive, can I take a sample along with your measurements? The more I know about you, the easier it will be to prepare any equipment or support items you may need. Retracting her hand from Alyssa's, Luna's expression relaxed but still exuded a bit of discomfort as she said, Thanks for the offer, but I don't plan on leaping into danger or becoming a hero. I'll lend a hand where I can, but this is all, a bit much you know. Blinking in surprise, Melissa tilted her head to the side before looking at Izuku and remarking, Wow, you must really like her to have sent a party invitation without persuading her to join us. It just felt right. Replied Izuku, shrugging his shoulders with a relaxed, unrepentant look. In truth, he had every intention of cutting ties with Luna once his stint in the US was over, but with the unexpected appearance of a breach in downtown Manhattan, he felt he couldn't just leave her in the dark and without the means to protect herself. He didn't love her, but she had definitely grown on him in their short time together. Misinterpreting Izuku's words as a kind of confession, Luna's bond level, which had temporarily decreased to 88, shot up to 97 as her coochie, which was a bit sore and slightly swollen after receiving continuous punishment, clenched expectantly. More notably, at least to Izuku and Melissa, her tail began to wag as she lowered her snout and stared at Izuku with upturned eyes and a bashful somewhat embarrassed smile. Making Luna feel even more embarrassed Melissa, her blue eyes shining like stars, stared at Izuku and gave a thumbs up, declaring, I understand completely. Madai. 
groaned Luna, feeling gratified but more embarrassed than when her father showed up for career day at her elementary school and used the opportunity to warn the boys in her class to keep their hands to themselves. Thus, after rolling her eyes, she promptly retreated into the master bedroom, leaving Izuku and Melissa to speak alone. She really is super cute. Melissa muttered, staring in the direction of Luna's departure, before turning her gaze to Izuku and asking, have you eaten? Something besides Luna, of course. Yeah, we ordered food from the restaurant downstairs, replied Izuku. Though if you're asking me if I want to grab a bite to eat, I won't say no. You know how insatiable my appetite is. Yes, I'm well aware. Replied Melissa, boldly wrapping her arms around Izuku's neck despite her stomach trembling in nervousness. She normally wasn't very forward, but seeing how close Izuku and Luna had gotten in a single day, Melissa felt compelled to assert herself at least a little. They couldn't shaboink with all the security and surveillance around, but kissing on the couch while waiting for their room service to arrive was a sufficient compromise. Be careful on your way, and if anything happens, don't hesitate to call. I won't be in the States for much longer, but if you find yourself in trouble, I'll do what I can to help, assured Izuku, cradling Luna in his arms as he prepared to see her off at the underground parking lot. And what if I just want to see or talk to you? Asked Luna, enjoying the feeling of such a powerful and influential figure fretting over her. She was still a little skeptical of the idea of being romantically involved with a boy who had more women than digits, but after boosting her intelligence and acquiring the healthy body and sharp mind perks, Luna felt she would be at a loss if she simply moved on and treated their chance encounter as a fling. I'm going to be busy with the breaches and hero work, but if you really wanted to meet up, I could have you flown out to London, meet you at a restaurant or hotel, and have you returned in less time than it takes some movies to end. Replied Izuku, sliding his hands to Luna's rear and giving it a firm squeeze as he added, or you could stick around. That sounds like a tremendous waste of money and resources, mused Luna. However, as her tail wagged behind her, she rubbed her face and neck against Izuku's, enjoying his embrace as she whispered, I'll keep my ear to the ground and eyes on the news. If things get bad, I'll talk to my mama and convince my babo to let me bring some of my younger nieces and nephews to Japan. Will that be okay? I take care of my own. Izuka replied, weakening his hold on Luna's body, meeting her gaze, and caressing her cheek with a smoldering half-lidded smile as he asserted, even if you wanted to bring over your entire family, I would find a way to make it happen. Then the next time we meet, muttered Luna, her voice lowering and eyes narrowing as he placed her hand over Izuku's and teased, I'll bring my sisters along. I've confirmed that you can handle at least one Deluca girl, but wolves are pack hunters. Let's see how you handle three of us at the same time. Exhaling a dry scoffing chuckle, Izuku caressed Luna's cheek with his thumb as he fearlessly replied, I'm not that greedy, but if you do bring them along, I'll be sure you each get your fill. Look forward to it whispered Luna, punctuating her words by licking Izuku's lips. Then with the keys of a different rental, she got into a steel-gray sports car and departed the underground parking lot with an engine-revving donut and an ear-piercing, tread-wearing peel-out. Had Thomas been present to see it, he doubtlessly would have cried tears of blood. With the appearance of a breach in downtown Manhattan, the United Nations summit meeting was temporarily suspended as New York was placed in a state of emergency. Tasha Nori and Kathleen were called in to help keep the situation under control, but as he was still just a provisional hero, Izuku, like many visiting slash foreign heroes, was barred from entering the breach's three-block cordon. Fortunately, while Tasha Nori and Kathleen couldn't enter the breach due to their levels, New York was the second most hero-saturated metropolis in the entire world. There were a few dozen casualties when the breach first appeared, but most of the heroes and military forces who ventured inside it emerged and scathed as the level range of the monsters within bird-like raptors known as Paradise Eaters, was only 2530. September 4, 2149. Since he was essentially under house arrest after the fiasco of his first outing, Izuku was relaxing on the sofa of his suite, lazily perusing videos of the breach's interior, provided as a courtesy by Nizu, when a pleasant ringing sound echoed through his suite. Is that the doorbell? It feels different from the last time. Izuku noted, rising from the sofa and making his way over to the intercom to see who was outside. There were only a handful of people who could get past the personnel barring entry onto the floor, but Izuku still found himself at a loss when the beaming face of Historia, accompanied by the petite, pigtailed Rebecca. Recovering from his brief stupor, Izuku pressed the intercom button and asked, Can I help you with something? Smiling even more radiantly, Historia explained, 
We've come to receive and escort you, Sir Midoriya, to the helipad on the roof. Did Sir Nizu not inform you? As if in response to Historia's question, Izuku's phone vibrated, prompting him to pull it out and see that Nizu had texted him. More accurately, the cheeky rat sent him a custom emoji of himself making a peace sign, along with the words, Enjoy your time in London. That explains why he never sent me a flight itinerary. Izuku thought, externally pressing the intercom button to state, We'll be out in a few minutes, before turning away to bid farewell to Melissa, sleeping in the master bedroom. She wasn't particularly surprised, as they both knew he would be flying out sometime that morning. But before allowing him to go, Melissa insisted they take a shower together since Azuka's body was thick with the aroma of their passionate lovemaking, made possible due to the anti-surveillance equipment she had set up to prevent people from spying on them using conventional means. You certainly took your time. You could have at least invited us in for tea and to have a sit-down. Stated the diminutive Rebecca, staring at Azuku with half-lidded eyes after he finally emerged from his suite. Countering Rebecca's cute glower with a relaxed smile, Izuku explained, I already had company, and I wasn't informed you would be arriving. Had I known, I would have made preparations to receive you. Since I didn't, I can only apologize. Recalling how Historia had greeted him in the past, Izuku placed his hand over his chest, bowing ever so slightly as he said, Please forgive me, Sir Arthur, Lady Bedivere. Not expecting to be called a lady, Rebecca's large, turquoise blue eyes widened as distinctive, circular blush marks appeared on her cheeks. As for Historia, she adopted a faint cordial smile and assured, Sir Midoriya has done nothing to warrant an apology. But, as it would not do to keep our plane and pilot waiting, we should depart post-haste. Raising his head, Izuku mirrored Historia's smile as he gestured toward the elevators and said, Lead the way. It would be my pleasure, replied Historia, seizing the initiative to turn and walk ahead with her hands behind her back. She was used to others following in her wake, so as Izuku and Rebecca followed behind her, she hummed a sonorous battle hymn, her emerald green eyes glistening as she fantasized about the battles and triumphs that awaited her return to Britain. This isn't quite what I expected. Thought Izuku, sitting beside Historia and Rebecca as they awaited the arrival of their plane, a commercial jet that would ferry them and more than 600 other passengers from New York to London. Historia's family was more than wealthy enough to fly privately, owning several private and military aircraft, but because of her extreme chinibiism, the golden-haired heroine insisted they travel with the masses, not elevate themselves above them. Fortunately, while they had to wait nearly three hours due to delays, followed by six and a half hours of flight time, Izuku didn't mind too much as they at least flew first class. With London five hours ahead of New York, it was late in the evening when Izuku, Historia, and Rebecca's plane touched down. On their way out, they encountered a tall gentlemanly-looking man with swept-back silver hair, a curly mustache, and a monocle dressed in butler-like attire, smiling as he held an ornate sign with the name Historia on it. Alphonse! exclaimed Historia, beaming as she approached the man and added, You didn't need to come all this way on my account. Still, I appreciate it greatly. It is my delight to be at the service of the young mistress, replied Alphonse, crossing his hand over his chest and bowing roughly fifteen degrees. Then raising his head, he met Izuka's gaze with a grandfatherly smile and added, And you must be Izuka Midoriya. Allow me to be among the first to welcome you to Britannia. Though Alphonse's way of referring to Britain was a little archaic, Izuka returned a smile and replied, I'm certain it will be an enjoyable, or at the very least, an educational experience. On that note, my mistress welcomes your stay at the Pendragon estate until your room at the academy has been prepared, revealed Alphonse, prompting Historia to clap her hands and chime, an excellent suggestion. We can retire early tonight, and then I can escort Sir Midoriya around the family estate and museum after breakfast. I certainly wouldn't mind a tour of the Pendragon estate, but I'm afraid it will have to wait, said Izuku, smiling as he directed his gaze to a group of smartly dressed men and women approaching them in black, Kevlar mesh suits and dark sunglasses. More importantly, they were escorting a young woman with a spiky black ponytail, a large bang framing the right side of her face, and sharp black eyes that exuded intelligence as she took broad steps like a supermodel, her well-developed body garbed in fashionable attire that consisted of a flower-patterned white blouse that hung off her shoulders, a frilly red bodice and skirt, and black stockings that balanced the black choker bearing a golden, coin-shaped nameplate with the name Momo on it. Stepping past Historia's group, Izuku spread his arms slightly and allowed the gorgeous woman to step into his embrace, the two exchanging a brief hug that allowed him to discern a faint vibration emanating from her body. Releasing his hold on the woman, Izuku adopted a knowing smile before fixing his expression, 
turning to face Historia's group, and introducing, this beautiful young lady is Yairozu Momo, the woman I am fortuitous to be affianced. Folding her hands over her lap and bowing slightly, Momo politely added, it is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, before raising her head and smiling as she surprised everyone but Izuku by revealing, as I shall be attending Izuku Kuen at the academy, I look forward to getting to know and working alongside you in the future. Wait, you're going to be his attendant? asked Rebecca, eyes wide in disbelief as she questioned. But, aren't you the heiress to the Yayarozu Logistics and Support Group? If someone of your status and caliber were to attend the Royal Academy as a member of the service course, it would completely upend things. This arrangement is supported by my father and grandfather, and the headmaster of the Royal Academy, Sir Arcturus Pendragon, has already authorized my transfer, stated Momo, amused by the stunned look on Rebecca's face. She originally planned to enroll as an ordinary student, but when she brought the matter to her grandfather, he told her that if she were going to keep playing the part of Izuku's secretary slash manager, she might as well enroll in the service course to make a statement. That way, when other affluent students and their families learned of the arrangement, they would instinctively regard Izuku as someone equal to or above them in status. Shaking his head in mock exasperation, Izuku's expression relaxed, his smile softening as he appended, regarding the previous topic, I've already made arrangements to reside at one of the Yairozu family's villas while I'm not at the academy. The tour of your family's estate will have to wait until a holiday or another occasion when we both have time to spare. Then I shall have someone forward Ms. Yairozu my schedule, said Historia, turning to meet Momo's gaze and adding, Please arrange for us to have tea and lunch at the earliest opportunity. There is much I wish to discuss with Sir Midoriya, but circumstances prevent me from broaching particularly sensitive subjects without due precaution. Nodding slightly, Momo replied, If the lesser Lady Pendragon sends me her schedule, I will arrange things at the earliest convenience. Please call me Arthur, said Historia, leaving Momo momentarily taken aback until Izuku explained, It's her epithet as the leader of the round table. Ms. Schneider's here is Bedivere. Ah! uttered Momo, recovering from her confusion and catching Izuku a little off guard as she questioned, Does that make you the Green Knight? Or perhaps Gawain? With sparkling eyes, Historia remarked, Your knowledge of the Arthurian legend is praiseworthy. Unfortunately, while I did consider Gawain as Sir Midoriya's moniker to his and Japan's association with the sun, his status as a foreigner complicates things. Furthermore, shifting her gaze to Izuku, Historia's smile broadened as she explained, even after the advent of quirks, green is an uncommon and particularly standout hair color. For that reason, crass as it may be, I concluded that green knight was most befitting of Sir Midoriya. Let us just hope that the one who receives the namesake of Gawain doesn't repeat the mistakes of his forebear. If he tries, he'll find my head is much harder to cut off than most, mused Izuku, massaging his neck for emphasis. His words caused Historia's eyes to glisten with even greater intensity, but before they could speak further, Alphonse interjected to politely suggest, I believe it would be prudent to continue this conversation at a time and location more suitable for lengthy discussions. Our presence is beginning to garner better avoided attention and curiosity. Placing her hand over her chest, Historia followed Alphonse's suggestion, stating, Then let us part here and reconvene back at the academy. I look forward to learning alongside and befriending you both. Returning some parting words of their own, Izuku and Momo waited for Historia's group to depart before leaving in the opposite direction. Momo had prepared a helicopter for them to get an overview of the historic city, but a proper survey would have to wait for a later date as they spent most of the flight over to her family's villa making out. There, Momo showed off the student-made attire she would be wearing as a student of the service course. The skirt was a bit long, extending to her ankles, but once rolled up, it provided a tantalizing view of Momo's very adult panties, perfectly sculpted giat, and the garter belt connecting to her stockings. Once we've picked up our student badges and IDs from the admissions office, there will be a short tour of the campus before you're to meet and introduce yourself to the other students of the night course, explained Momo, sitting atop Izuku's lap as she listed off the events of his itinerary from her tablet. Has Historia already sent you her schedule? Asked Izuku, a bit uncertain as they hadn't exchanged contact information. Nodding in affirmation, Momo revealed, I received an email this morning via my student inbox. Here, would you like to take a look? I found it to be a bit, unusual to say the least. Receiving the proffered tablet, Izuku immediately understood what Momo found odd. Most of the detailed information about Historia's schedule had been redacted. This included time slots when she was supposed to be in class, so if someone who didn't know her true identity were to take a look at it, 
they would find it suspicious and confusing. Since it wasn't his secret to protect, Izuku readily revealed, Historia is Europe's no. Ein hero, Pendragon. She likely spends most of her day sitting in front of television and computer screens, monitoring and foiling criminal acts. Blinking in surprise, Momo remained confused as she asked, Europe's no. One hero is a schoolgirl? I don't doubt your words, but as I recall, the current Pendragon is Historia's father, who has been active for well over two decades. Yeah, she's set to inherit his title once she graduates, revealed Izuku. But she's already been filling the role for the past six or seven years, at least according to the principal. All I've confirmed for myself is that she is an exceedingly powerful quirk user and someone who will play a key role in resolving the MWT phenomenon. I see. Muttered Momo, bringing her hand up to her mouth and nibbling the slightly elongated nail of her right thumb with furrowed brows. Izuku was compelled to ask what she was thinking, but before he could, Momo rang his mind like a gong as she said, then we'll need to get her in your harem. Someone with that much power and potential can't be allowed to fall into enemy hands or under external influence. Seeing Izuku's neutral deadpan, Momo stared at him in confusion before adopting an increasingly bashful look as she smiled nervously and asked, Did I? Speak out of turn? Recovering from his momentary stupor, Izuku shook his head and kissed Momo's cheek before saying no. I was just a little taken aback as, for a moment, you reminded me of the principal. As far as adding Historia to my harem is concerned, we'll see how things play out. She's a bit, lacking in certain aspects, but she's certainly cute enough. Aspects like this? Asked Momo, regaining her smile as she pushed up and gently pressed together her sizable immaculately shaped melons. And this? Replied Izuku, sliding his hand to Momo's, but in giving it a playful squeeze. They still had a few hours before they needed to set out for the academy. So after an impromptu make-out session, Momo showed him around the mansion-sized villa and to the dungeon beneath it. Though London was one of the cities in Europe, and the largest in Britain, a sizable hundred-acre plot had been set aside for the Royal Academy, built atop the ruins of the former Queen's Wood, north of the city centre. The Yayarozu Villa was a seaside property located near the mouth of the River Thames, so Izuku and Momo needed to travel nearly two hours via car to reach the Royal Academy's front entrance a large golden gateway flanked by 10-meter-tall walls of alabaster stone that encircled the entire campus. Waiting for Momo to open the door at her insistence, Izuku emerged from the black Bentley that had transported them, hands in his pockets as he stared up at the massive clock tower that sat at the heart of the campus, a grandiloquent structure constructed as a memorial after the Houses of Parliament, Westminster Abbey, and Elizabeth Tower Big Ben, were blown up during the war. It was constructed to resemble the original Elizabeth Tower, but since innovation and technology had developed explosively in the wake of quirks, it was more than three times taller than the original as a kind of schmuck you to the people that had destroyed it. With Momo following at a close but respectable distance behind him with her hands folded over her lap, Izuku entered the building they had parked outside of, a fairly small but elegant stone structure built in the fashion of the Gothic. Revival period. It made use of pointed arches above entryways, a decorative tympanum fashioned in the shape of the school's crest and was almost entirely constructed of cobbled marble and limestone, giving it a kind of ambience reminiscent of a medieval court. Seeing Izuku and Momo enter the building wearing their uniforms but absent the ornate golden badges and cufflinks that denoted their status as students of the Royal Academy, a mature woman with long purple hair and matching eyes rose from her position behind at a lavish wooden desk, smiling as she said, You must be Izuku Midoriya and his attendant, Momo Yairozu. We've been expecting you. Please write this way. Without waiting for Izuku and Momo to respond, the woman, dressed as a secretary in a somewhat frilly white blouse, a pencil skirt, black stockings and high heels, led them through a door and into a room that resembled a dry cleaning or cobbling facility. There were several garment conveyors with student uniforms, shelves of various types of shoes, neatly arranged leather book bags, and most pertinently, an area set up like a professional photo shoot, complete with a three-point lighting setup, a $300,000 camera and a backdrop whose hue could be changed to complement the skin tones of individual students. Gesturing toward the backdrop, the woman, whom Izuku had identified as Olivia Campbell, adopted a relaxed smile that didn't quite reach her eyes as she said, Please take turns standing in front of the backdrop so I can take the photos for your student identification cards. It will take around 15 minutes for your IDs to be finished. After that, since you've already received your uniforms, I can provide you with a campus map or give you a personal tour. The important thing is that you report to the amphitheater at the rear of the campus before 2 p.m. That's where those enrolled in the night course will be assembling. 
Then once we're finished here, we'll look around on our own, said Izuku, meeting Olivia's skeptical gaze with a smile as he stated, it's much more enjoyable to discover things on your own. Shrugging as if it didn't concern her, Olivia made her way behind the camera, adjusting its settings as she said, so long as you stay out of trouble and don't intrude into any ongoing classes, you're welcome to roam as you please. If you're uncertain about something, consult the student handbook I'll give you after this. It includes the school's rules, bylaws, and an overview of our history. There is a point-based system where you can gain or have points deducted based on your actions, but that might not apply to students in the night course. Sounds useful, said Izuku, stepping before the camera and adopting a faint smile. Olivia quickly snapped his photo, and once he was satisfied with how it came out, she did the same with Momo. From there, she let them freely choose book bags and invited them to take as many shoes as they liked, but since Momo could produce even higher quality items at will, Izuku spent the time texting the girls while his dutiful maid reviewed the student handbook. They had both memorized its contents, but since there could be differences between the digital and physical copies, Momo was being prudent by comparing the book's contents against the version stored in her brain via encyclopedic knowledge. With about 20 minutes to spare before 2 p.m., Izuku and Momo made their way to the amphitheater Olivia had told them about, a coliseum-like structure with a sloping, semi-circular seating gallery that served a similar purpose to the UA Sports Festival Stadium. The center was a flat stone arena the size of a soccer field, but the terrain could be modified with the push of a button to emulate seven different battlefields for use in training, competition, and combat exams. It gives the impression we're about to fight, doesn't it? Asked Izuku, entering the arena at ground level with Momo trailing close behind him. In response, as she was playing the part of an experienced maid, she closed her eyes and stoically replied, if it comes to that, I'm certain that Master will come out on top. Of course mused Izuku, his eyes passing over the 47 other night candidates present. Many possessed even lower levels than the similarly aged attendants accompanying them, but a handful, particularly those who, like himself, had transferred in, were monsters in the making. A few even had statuses that indicated they had entered breaches. Name, Hande Jung title, zombie nemesis, damage against undead increased by 200%. Quirk, Focus Bond Level, 44 Current Level, 39 Effective Level, 68 Attributes Strength, 42 Agility, 30 Vitality, 143 Intelligence, 240 Dexterity, 58 Luck, 169 Free Attributes, 100 Perks, Mana Detection, Magical Aptitude, Lucky Skills Read, Falsify, Bash, Mana Shield, Mana Bolt, Charged Mana Bolt, Mana Detection, Able to Sense and Manipulate Mana, Magical Aptitude, Learning speeds and proficiency with magic increased. Lucky, marginally improves the success rate of dice rolls and other luck-based skill checks. Read, able to see the statuses of others. If the difference in capabilities is too great, the information is limited. Falsify, able to conceal or modify your status to thwart the reading ability of others. Bash, inflict bludgeoning damage on a target. Strikes to a target's head have a chance to crit and stun. Mana Shield. Create a wall or sphere of mana to block attacks. The greater the surface area of the shield, the weaker it is. Mana Bolt. Condense mana into the shape of an arrow and send it flying at the target. The projectile has innate homing properties, but the user has to remain focused on what they're trying to hit. Charged Mana Bolt. Empower a mana bolt to deal significantly increased damage. A longer charge results in exponential damage, but the accuracy is compromised. If the user is unlucky or loses focus, the empowered bolt may explode. What is he the gamer? Wondered Izuku, meeting the gaze of the fairly ordinary-looking youth with messy brown hair partially covering his eyes, brown eyes, and somewhat pasty skin, indicating he didn't receive much sunlight. His name indicated he was Korean, but one of the most notable things about him was that he was one of only two people present without an attendant. Seeing Izuku stare directly at him, Dane quickly averted his eyes his skin becoming clammy and a bead of sweat forming on his cheek as if he had inadvertently caught the attention of his bully. It was fairly pathetic, but Izuka didn't know if the reaction was genuine or an attempt to entrap others as De Jung had one of the highest base levels among everyone present. In other words, he had a lot of experience. Adopting a smile, Izuku ignored the other students' curious, envious, and occasionally hate-filled gazes as he made his way toward De Jung. The timid-looking youth tensed at his approach, but Izuku was undaunted as he stopped a socially acceptable distance from Dae-yong, extended his right hand and said, My name is Izuku Midoriya, a transfer student from Japan's UA High. 
Might I ask what your name is? Though his initial response was to stare blankly at Izuka's hand, De Jong eventually reciprocated the handshake with a cold sweaty hand, timidly replying. My name is Han Dae Jung, from the Korean Peninsula's Sun Kyung Kwan Academy. Ah that's the no. Two school in Korea right? Asked Izuku, squeezing Dae Jung's hand firmly but not overbearingly as he added, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance Ding. Likewise. Replied Dae Jung, extricating his hand from Izuku's at the first opportunity. His gaze briefly darted to Momo, or more accurately her chest, but Izuka didn't take offense as it was a fairly natural reaction. Instead he took the opportunity to introduce her, gesturing with his hand as he said, and this is Momo Yairozu, my fiancé. She may be dressed as a maid, but don't let that fool you. Her pedigree and skill are enough to humble just about everyone here. Hearing Izuku's words, the candidates paying attention to the interaction began to whisper and gossip among themselves. Some recognized Momo from balls and galas she had attended with her parents, but because she was wearing a maid outfit, they assumed she just had a passing similarity to the person from their memories. Swallowing Izuka's bait hook, line and sinker, a thin fairly handsome youth with salmon pink pear, matching eyes, and a face that screamed, Do you have any idea who my father is? interjected to ask. Pardon me, but did you say this charming young lady is Momo Yairozu? My how long has it been? Though she glanced at the boy and recognized him from a charity gala she had attended in Paris, Momo closed her eyes rather than offering a response. Her reaction caused the youth to exhale a slight laugh, but as his already low bond level decreased from 39 to 30 in a single go, Izuku could tell the boy, Roman Acton, didn't appreciate being ignored. Name, Roman Alexander Acton title party invitation required quirk, octopus bond level, 30 current level, 23 effective level, 43 attributes strength, 38 agility, 40 vitality, 122 intelligence, 73 dexterity, 108 luck, 58 free attributes, 115 perks party invitation required. His stats aren't terrible. Thought Izuku, outwardly wearing a smile as he extended his hand to the arrogant looking boy and said, Hello there. My name is Itsuku Midoriya. You are? Suppressing his derision, Roman adopted a practiced smile of his own as he accepted Izuku's handshake, putting an increasing amount of strength into his grip as he responded, Roman Alexander Acton, son of Sir Andrew Archibald Acton and the heir apparent to Acton Foundation. Might I be so bold as to who your parents are? I am unfamiliar with the name Midoriya, but they must be impressive to have such close ties with the Yeo Yorisus. Causing Roman's bond level to plummet even further, Izuku tightened his own grip, easily overpowering the humanoid Taiko, Octopus, as he casually replied, sorry but that's classified. Clenching his teeth discreetly, Roman endured Izuka's handshake for a moment longer before retracting his hand and responding, well aren't you mysterious? In a flat, unamused tone. Then, after one final look at Momo, who was still ignoring him, he turned and walked away, several other rich-looking boys and their female attendants following after him as he muttered, slit-eyed monkey. Even though Izuka's eyes were rounder than his, that was mean of you whispered Momo, waiting until she and Izuku were out of easy earshot from others. There's a good chance he'll be one of the round table members, said Izuku, referring to Dae-yong. By approaching him and then confronting one of the more affluent people present, he effectively tied Dae-yong to him by making him a target for those who despised but didn't dare to act against him directly. As Momo said, this was somewhat mean-spirited of him, but since Dae-yong would have been target anyway, there was no harm in laying a foundation for their future cooperation. Trusting Izuka's judgment, Momo decided not to pursue the matter and simply closed her eyes to avoid the many glances sent her way. Her only obligation was to do as Izuku commanded, a notion that made her heart flutter, so as the time counted down to 2 p.m., she busied herself thinking about how she could assist him in pulling Historia to their side. As if given form by Momo's thoughts, Historia appeared, accompanied by Rebecca and a golden-haired man whose appearance and clothing could best be described as kingly. He had the same golden hair as Historia but it was shorter and swept to the side, his rightmost bangs framing the side of his face, curving toward his green eyes. His face was marked with age, but rather than reducing his charm, it gave him a certain regality that was emphasized by his short golden goatee and confident smile. Name, Arcturus Lucius Pendragon title, Lion King, Vit plus 100 quirk, Lord of Camelot, Vestige, Armory Vestige, Displacement, Vestige Bond Level, 61 Current Level, 78 Effective Level, 152 attributes strength, 198 agility, 180 vitality, 
641 intelligence, 130 dexterity, 163 luck, 209 free attributes, 350 perks, mana detection, dragon's heart, dragon scales, skills, sword master, horizon strike, sacred shield, rallying cry. Seeing their headmaster and Britons know. One hero appear, the longtime students of the academy and their attendants turn toward him, placed their hands over their chests, and bowed their heads. A few of them came from families whose social status was superior to the Pendragons, but not even the king and queen would dare withhold courtesy from the man and family, who made their country one of the safest in the world. His level is nearly as high as Rumi's was during our first meeting. Noted Izuku. However, as Arcturus was short 40 free attribute points and had a visible title, perks and skills, it was apparent he had entered at least one breach, gaining eight levels in the process. Noticing Izuku's clear, analyzing gaze, Arcturus briefly met it, his smile becoming marginally more prominent and his bond level increasing by one before he smoothly broke eye contact and made his way to the front of the gathered students, all eyes on him. In a deep voice that exuded charisma, Arcturus placed his hand over his chest and gave a slight bow before standing tall and stating, Welcome young lords, ladies, and visiting friends from afar. Many of you already know who I am, but permit me to introduce myself. I am Arcturus Lucius Pendragon, fourth to succeed the name of Pendragon and a proud knight of Her Majesty, Queen Mary II and her husband, Prince Henry. I am also the headmaster of the Royal Academy of Heroics and as your actual teacher has been delayed, the stand-in that will explain the situation, the structure of this class, and the benefits that come with being a student of this very experimental program. Covering his mouth to clear his throat, Arcturus opened his eyes, pausing for a moment before adopting a mischievous smile and adding, at least, that's what I should do. Instead, I'll trust you to check your emails and read the information packets we sent out a few minutes ago. As for what we'll actually be doing. Holding his left hand out to the side, palm facing back, a flash of golden light precluded the appearance of an ornate longsword in Arcturus's hand. As it did, the sky overhead suddenly turned dark as a dark hemispherical barrier appeared and trapped everyone in the arena. This sent a wave of confusion through the students, but things became infinitely more chaotic when the ground began to crack open, followed by 1-2-M tall humanoids with green skin, pointed ears, and goat-like eyes materializing from below. The smaller ones wore soiled loincloths and wielded makeshift weapons, but the larger ones sported mismatched armor and carried rusted swords, spears, and hammers. You think yourselves worthy to enter the breaches? exclaimed Arcturus, swinging his sword horizontally, its form blurring like a whip. As he did so, a flash of gold light emerged from the blade's edge, traveling swiftly as it sliced through several of the green-skinned humanoids, a type of monster known around the world, goblins. Name Gabutin species, goblin title, none quirk, fish and bond level, zero current level, 19 effective level, 19 attributes strength, 23 agility, 35 vitality, 64 intelligence, 15 dexterity, 37 luck, 22 free attributes, zero perks, disease resistance, Toxic Saliva, Dark Vision, Skills Bite, Sprint, Vicious Assault. Hmm. So this is what a monster status looks like. Thought Izuku, enveloping his fists and body with Black Whip and materializing his crimson, Nano Mesh Gauntlets. At the same time, Momo pinched and raised her skirt slightly, dozens of flash grenades spilling out of it and onto the ground. Using tendrils from his Black Whip, Izuku picked up, removed the pins from the grenades, and tossed them at the goblins furthest away. Then, as he and Momo had already been standing along the periphery, he took a look around before making a sweeping motion with his left hand, black whip extending from the tips of his fingers like piano strings, slicing apart the closest goblins. You have received 6,824 experience for killing Gabagok, LV-20. Seeing the tiny notification that briefly appeared before vanishing, Izuka's pupils dilated. He expected the experience gained from killing monsters to be substantial, especially since he gained approximately 36x the base amount with Momo nearby, but 13,648 for a single goblin, split between two people, was unexpected but welcome. Receiving the same notification as Izuku, Momo's eyes similarly widened as she realized they would only need to kill a total of 11 more goblins to level to 30. After that, she would require 1 million EXP per level, but even then, they would only need to defeat 147. There were only around a hundred goblins present, but once they began delving into the breaches, it might not even take a full week for her to catch up to Izuku and surpass most of her teachers. Sorry everyone, but it looks like I'm going to get a bit ahead. Thought Momo, 
apologizing to her friends and Rod sisters in her mind. She hadn't even thought about it when Izuku asked her to accompany him, but now she was determined to become as strong as possible to support him, her family, her friends, and the world as a whole. Looking at Izuku, who had begun to kill goblins en masse, Momo caught his attention as she said, Please provide me some cover with your black whip. I don't wish to just stand here and observe. Sure thing, replied Izuku, creating a half dome between him, Momo, and the other students. As he did so, Momo tore open the front of her blouse, exposing her black lace brassier and milky white melons before producing a stringless compound bow from her chest, handing it to Izuku so he could string it for her as she tossed actual grenades at the goblins on their side of the barrier. Here, said Izuku, handing Momo the strung bow. She accepted it with a loving smile and a curt thank you before doing something that was both expected and inexplicable, producing arrows from her palm, knocking, and releasing them in a single smooth motion. Izuku later questioned why she didn't simply use a gun, but since conventional weapons didn't work in the breaches, the answer was obvious. Though things were fairly chaotic initially, the gathered students were still aspiring heroes. Some of them only pursued the title of hero for the fame and prestige it warranted, but to attain that, they needed to be one of the top heroes in the country. Thus, with nearly equal numbers, the students made short work of the comparably weak goblins. MMM. It's good to see that everyone survived. Some of you didn't do anything, but I can overlook it since it's not easy to act in such a large group without an established chain of command, said Arcturus, standing with his hands folded on the pommel of his ornate sword, the tip planted in the ground. Raising his hand, Roman, the back of his uniform torn open to allow for a number of pink octopoid tentacles to materialize from his back, waited to be acknowledged before asking, Sir Pendragon, I believe I speak for the majority when I ask what it is you were thinking? I understand that we're gathered here in preparation for delving into the breaches, but forcing us to fight for our lives without warning or access to our hero costumes and support items was a bit irresponsible. And that is precisely the point I was trying to make, said Arcturus. The breaches are places where you risk your lives and have no choice but to kill your opponents. The opportunities they provide for growth are beyond imagination, but it's all meaningless if you lose your lives due to a lack of preparation or failing to remain calm in the face of unexpected threats and unknown dangers. I see. Thank you for the explanation, replied Roman, lowering his hand and nodding sagely. Virtually everyone present knew he was just putting on airs and trying to show off by standing up to Arcturus, but such was par for the course in high society. As he was accustomed to such behavior, Arcturus completely disregarded Roman, continuing where he left off by explaining, now that you've had a taste of what monsters and the breaches are like, you have the next hour to split into groups of three to five night candidates. If you need to return to your dorms or retrieve your equipment, now is the time to do so. In the future, you will not be afforded such a luxury. Dismissed. With a wave of his hand and a boom of his voice, Arcturus caused most of the night course students to disperse. Roman and his cronies remained nearby, but the only people who stayed back were Historia, Rebecca, and those like Izuku and Momo, who didn't have dorms to return to. Seizing the opportunity, Historia caused her father's brow to twitch as she approached Izuku and Momo, smiling as she said, it may be difficult for the two of you to find teammates on short notice. If you find it agreeable, Bedivere and I will join you. I honestly expected it, replied Izuku, matching Historia's smile. Before she could celebrate their successful union however, he gestured with his head toward Han Dae-yung, standing off to the side with a troubled look. Mind if he joins as our final member? asked Izuku. Appearances aside, he should be fairly capable. Following Izuku's gaze, Historia's emerald green eyes briefly shimmered before she nodded and replied, I agree. He is nowhere near as powerful as Sir Midoriya, but he possesses an inordinate amount of mana. Should I head over and invite him to join us, or will you do the honors? I'm ultimately just a visitor to your school and nation, responded Izuku. With that in mind, it would be better if you invited him and took charge of the group. I'm typically a solo act, but I can play the part of support well enough. As she had intended to let Izuku take charge, Historia experienced a brief pause when he unhesitantly deferred to her. She was supremely confident in her abilities, but Historia knew she still had a long way to go before she could contend against Izuku's effective level of 890. He was, after all, the successor to the symbol of peace. Narrowing her eyes into a smile, Historia happily hummed, then please wait here. Assuming a favorable response, I shall return with our final ally shortly. Without waiting for Izuku to respond, 
Historia romped over to Dae Young with the manic energy of a child. The unkempt Korean was shocked and visibly unnerved by her approach, but after learning why she had come over, he felt a mix of relief, confusion, and wariness as he looked over to Izuku, his discomfort increasing when he saw the latter smiling relaxedly back at him. Returning to Izuku with Dae Young in tow, Historia happily mused, Sir Dae Young has agreed to join us. I can see that, replied Izuku, meeting the timid-looking Korean's gaze, smiling as he added, Glad to have you with us, Sir Dae Young. You can drop the sir part. Muttered Dae Young. Then with slightly furrowed brows, he asked, Also, why did you invite me to your group? I'm fine on my own. Answering instead of Izuku, Historia pointed out, but my father, I mean the headmaster required that we form groups of three to five. Even if Sir Dae Young is confident in his capabilities, there are situations such as this where you'll have no choice but to cooperate with others. I know that. Responded Dae Young, a bead of sweat forming on his right cheek as he lowered his gaze. However while he looked timid, there was a hint of frustration and mild resentment in his eyes as he muttered, but I don't need pity. Not from someone normie bastard. In Korean. Though he wasn't fluent in Korean, Izuku knew enough to understand what Dae Young had said. He knew the normie bastard Dae Young was referring to was him, but instead of getting annoyed he joked, hey we might not be close, but I know who my father is. More importantly, we're not pitying you. I suggested that Historia invite you to our group, because you're strong. Stronger than most of these pampered pricks, at least. You say that as if you're not one of them. Rebutted Dae Young raising his gaze slightly but not to look at Izuku. Instead, he focused on Momo or more accurately, her melons. She was wearing a mantle to cover up, but if you looked closely, there was a glimmer of exposed flesh in the gap between the fabric. Hmm. Doing his best not to get annoyed, Izuku thought about what he could say in his defense, but it was unnecessary as Historia calmly stated, You are mistaken, Sir Ding. Sir Midoriya wasn't born to an affluent family. All he has acquired has been wrought through hard work, circumstance, and a touch of fate. He isn't without his flaws, but to err is human. Continuing to work hard, despite your mistakes and setbacks, is what allows a person to rise above and become a true, noble soul. Though her words were spoken plainly, there was a particular certitude to Historia's words that made all who heard them feel varying degrees of awe and inspiration. This was 100% the result of her authority, but Dae-young had no way of knowing that as, Despite possessing the rare ability to read other statuses, Izuku's Historias, and Momo's barely provided more than their names. Feeling slightly guilty after hearing Historia's speech, Daeung exhaled a sigh before raising his gaze to meet Izuku's, his expression uncomfortable but exuding a trace of sincerity as he said, Sorry, I'm not really good with people, and you, your appearance and the way you carry yourself. It made me think you've never had to work for anything. It's fine, replied Izuku adopting a friendly smile and extending his hand for a second handshake as he joked, I've definitely received more than my fair share of good fortune. One look at my fiancé is enough to make a case for me being one of the luckiest men in the world. Not expecting to be dragged into the discussion, Momo's cheeks glowed a bright shade of pink, her eyes watering slightly as she fought to repress a somewhat goofy smile. She had always been weak to praise, so hearing Izuku claim to be one of the luckiest people in the world because he was affianced to her was gratifying but exceptionally embarrassing. Failing in her efforts, Momo turned away from the group to massage the color from her cheeks and calm herself. The fact everyone was looking at her made the task more difficult. Fortunately, received a lifeline in the form of Arcturus, approaching the group with a cordial smile, his emerald green eyes fixed on Izuku as he asked, Mind lending this old man a bit of your time? It would be my honor, Sir Pendragon replied Izuku, placing his hand over his chest and giving a slight bow before rising and accompanying Arcturus a few meters away from the group, out of easy earshot. He had a few ideas about what the man wished to discuss, but he couldn't know for certain until Arcturus actually spoke. Turning to face his cuckoo, Arcturus's smile didn't quite reach his eyes as he broached the second most probable subject the former had in mind, his voice low and steady as he remarked, I've never seen my daughter take to someone so quickly. Did something happen while the two of you were in America? Other than being introduced to one another, we never even spoke until the day of our departure, replied Izuku, undaunted by the faint pressure exuding from Arcturus. The man was a powerhouse in his own right, but if they were to come to blows, Izuku had a near insurmountable advantage. The most Arcturus could do was teleport him away, but such abilities had a lot of restrictions. Sensing no deceit in Izuku's words, only a firm unwavering confidence. 
Arcturus closed his eyes and exhaled a faint sigh through his nose. He, of course, had done his homework on Izuku, but you could never truly grasp a person's character without meeting and interacting with them in person. Izuku possessed clear eyes without a trace of arrogance or incertitude. It was the gaze of someone who wasn't simply confident in themselves, but possessed the willingness to do whatever it took to achieve his goals. Opening his eyes, the smile on Arcturus's face faded, replaced by a serious look as he placed his hand on Izuku's shoulder and said, Even if you become the most powerful and influential person in this world, if you hurt my daughter, I will find a way to make you pay. Though he was tempted to say that Arcturus had misunderstood, and that he had no intention of pursuing Historia, Izuku knew that wasn't what the man wanted to hear. Thus, without any real hesitation, he responded with a curt nod and replied, I would expect no less. Snorting in amusement, Arcturus regained his smile and retracted his hand from Izuku's shoulder. Under normal circumstances, he would never allow his daughter to get involved with someone as prolific as Izuku was with his relationships with women. However, with the world's fate hanging in the balance, his top priorities were protecting his nation and keeping his family safe. In that regard, if Astoria decided that Izuku was the one she wished to walk and fight alongside, Arcturus would have nothing to say so long as the green-haired youth made her happy and kept her safe. As Izuku rejoined their group, Historia couldn't help but ask, What did you and the headmaster discuss? Of course, if it was something private, you need not answer. We discussed a few things, some secret, some mundane, replied Izuku, smiling as he explained. Among the latter were the circumstances of Mai and Momo's lodgings. Shield Industries has apparently prepared a bit of a surprise for us. Oh, I had heard we would be receiving support from I Island, revealed Historia, tilting her head slightly and holding her finger to her chin as she asked, is this unrelated? I do seem to recall hearing that you were close with Professor Shield and his daughter Melissa. Hearing Historia's remarks, an incredulous look adorned Dae Young's face. At the same time, though she was similarly aware of Izuku's collaboration with the Shields, Rebecca's eyes widened as she remarked, You must be referring to the facility that was recently built on the west side of campus. I knew it had something to do with Shield Industries, but I assumed it to be a facility for processing materials and resources found in the breaches. If that's your residence. Furrowing her brows with a mix of envy and skepticism, Rebecca asked, Just how big of a big shot are you? I mean I knew you were important since you were traveling with All Might and the principal of UA High, but to have an entire facility constructed in preparation for your arrival. Well if it does turn out to be a production facility or workshop, you're free to use it, said Izuku. Then before Rebecca could recover from the shock, he surprised her by asking, speaking of which, do you not need to retrieve any equipment or support items? I know your level is higher than nearly everyone else present, but I assumed you were a supporter. Blinking in surprise before adopting a suspicious look, Rebecca asked, What do you mean you know my level is higher than nearly everyone present? I don't recall mentioning it. You didn't, affirmed Izuku. Rebecca was then about to ask him how he knew, but he beat her to the punch by pointing out. But if you'll recall, my sensei mentioned that you and Arthur here have been entering C and B rank breaches. The requirement for entering a B rank breach is said to be level 50, so yours must be at least that high. Though Rebecca was prepared to swallow Izuku's words hook, line, and sinker Historia, standing with her hands behind her back, lost a bit of her smile as she tilted her head to the side and asked, Why are you lying? What do you mean? Asked Rebecca, confused. She knew Izuku had to be lying if Historia said so, but she clearly recalled that Nizu had, in fact, brought up that the two of them had been entering B-rank breaches. Preempting any potential accusations, Izuku met Historia's intense stare with a smile, his expression and tone calm as he said, Everyone has their secrets, Arthur. But I can say this much. I have no ill will toward you, your friend, or anyone else who doesn't go out of their way to target me or the people I care about. That should be enough, no. Regaining her smile, Historia unhesitantly replied, If everyone thought as such, there would certainly be less conflict in the world. I hope my words didn't offend you. Similar to Sir De Young, I too, suffer from an inability to communicate with others. Please pardon any improprieties on my part, as it is rarely my intention to offend, denigrate, or slight. It's not a problem, assured Izuku, smiling as he added, we all quite literally have our quirks. And once we get to know each other, the truth will flow naturally. For now, however, we should focus on what's to come. How do you want to handle the second test? Impressed by Izuku's reason and compassion, Historia's eyes glistened. But since he had asked for her opinion, she withheld her compliment and stated, 
my proficiencies lie in close and medium range combat. However, if Sir Midoriya desires it, I will relinquish the forward position and assume the role of a rear guard. You are undoubtedly the most capable among those present, so I will do my utmost to support and safeguard our allies, freeing you to act at your discretion. Thanks for the vote of confidence, replied Izuku, and he was genuinely grateful. After inheriting one for all, he had become increasingly bad at sitting back and watching others fight in his stead. His sense of duty and responsibility had compounded after Ares' recovery, but the revelation that Rumi had a bun in the oven was the straw that broke the camel's back. He had to become stronger before all for one or some other bastard messed everything up, so if Historia was willing to let him take point and hoard all the experience, Izuku wasn't going to protest. Rather, since fate and even her father seemed to be setting them up, he was certain he would make it up to her later. In more ways than simply expressing his gratitude. With the allotted time coming to an end, Arcturus waited for everyone to gather before pulling out what looked like a Viking war horn crafted from bone, explaining, within the breaches, you may occasionally find unique items and equipment, commonly known as magic items and artifacts. As the name implies, these items are imbued with an energy known as mana, granting them all manner of mysterious effects. This horn, for example, is called the Horn of Summoning Goblin. When blown, it absorbs the user's mana to summon anywhere between a single and 100 goblins of various strengths and sizes. Hearing Arcturus's explanation, the students of the night course reacted with emotions ranging from excitement to puzzlement and disbelief. They had all heard rumors of the breaches being a literal treasure trove of rare and valuable materials, but this was the first time any were hearing that actual magic was involved. I noticed doubt in many of your eyes. That is one of the many reasons we asked our guest from Korea to attend the Royal Academy. Han Dae-yung, please come forward, said Arcturus. First the normie, and now the principal. I thought I was supposed to be lucky. Muttered Dae-yung, hanging his head to avoid the sometimes curious, other times derisive gazes of the other students as he made his way to the front and stood beside Arcturus. Then, at Arcturus's request, he held out his hands, palms facing upward, and materialized a sphere of bright blue energy. So there is no confusion about what you're witnessing, student Dae Jung's quirk is focus, an ability that allows him to intensify his focus to the extent of perceiving the world in slow motion, explained Arcturus. What you see before you is mana, materialized and given form due to Dae Jung's extraordinary aptitude for mana manipulation. Turning his gaze to Dae Jung, Arcturus gave a curt nod and said, when you're ready, Please demonstrate for your fellow classmates the destructive capabilities of mana. Understood. Muttered Dae Jung, turning to the side so that no one was in front of him before sending the ball of spinning mana forward. It wasn't very fast, traveling slower than the average person could run, but when it impacted the arena's floor, it exploded with the force of several sticks of dynamite, generating a large plume of bluish-white light. Seeing what Dae Jung was capable of, the inordinately affluent youths that had hitherto ignored him had one of two prevailing thoughts, bringing the timid-seeming but powerful youth to their side and preventing others from doing the same. This included Roman, but since he knew Dae Jung had been scouted by Historia for this particular event, he decided to wait until later to approach him. As you can see, mana is an exceptionally powerful form of energy, said Arcturus, nodding his head and allowing Dae Jung to return to the crowd before explaining but it can be used for more than simply casting spells and destroying enemies from afar. Not everyone possesses the aptitude to become a mage, but once you acquire special abilities known as skills, you can do things like this. Pointing his sword toward the sky, Arcturus gathered mana into it, causing golden light to swirl around the blade in a double helix pattern, eventually forming a blade of light nearly 20 meters in length. Then with a swift downward strike, he created a crevasse more than 60 meters long, half a meter wide and nearly 20 meters deep at its deepest point. Not bad for an old man, wouldn't you agree? Mused Arcturus, resting his sword on his shoulder with a calm relaxed smile. Unfortunately, his duties prevented him from delving into more breaches, hampering his growth like others in the same position. This was one of the many reasons the night course was being created, as compared to professional heroes, who had long-standing duties like patrolling and policing designated areas, Students with provisional hero licenses had significantly more time on their hands. They were also the nation's future, especially in this instance, so allowing them to accumulate strength in relatively safe breaches was beneficial in more ways than one. After fielding a handful of questions, Arcturus proceeded to explain, For this second test, I will allow each of your groups to come forward, one at a time, and request between 1 and 100 goblins to face. Since my mana is limited, however, 
I can only summon around 300 in total. If you want to show off, you better step forward quick dash before Arcturus could finish. Historia raised her hand, her expression and tone filled with conviction as she proclaimed, I nominate my group to be the first to accept this challenge. Though many were annoyed that Historia got the jump on them, no one dared to complain. Even before she became a powerhouse by entering breaches, she had proven herself as the top student, not just of her year but the entire academy. Thus, even when Arcturus asked, would anyone like to challenge Historia for the right to go first? No one answered. Their school had a system where students could challenge others to a duel for specific rights and opportunities. But since Historia had never once lost a duel, no one stepped forward to be her next victim. Resisting the urge to snort, Arcturus instructed everyone but Historia's group to wait in the stands before asking, How many goblins will your group be challenging? One hundred, replied Historia, absent even an iota of hesitation. She really wanted to ask for three hundred, but since that would be unfair to the rest of the students, she settled on the maximum amount Arcturus mentioned in his explanation. I thought you might. Mused Arcturus, bringing the flute of summoning goblin to his lips, taking a barrel-chested breath, and blowing with all his might. As he did, goblins began to rise from the ground, similar to the first test. This time however, they were much better equipped as Arcturus had put more than half his mana into the summoning. Get into formation! Shouted Historia, but instead of charging forward, as she was prone to doing, she positioned herself to protect Momo and Dayung. Far more surprisingly, her school uniform disappeared into motes of bluish-white light, making her appear naked. Then like a magical girl, she materialized an old-fashioned royal blue dress with gold trim over pristine white hose, silvery greaves, gauntlets, a stylish breastplate, and an ornate longsword nearly as long as she was tall. After finishing her transformation by swinging her sword to the side in a sweeping motion, dispersing the light covering her body, Historia made a gesture with her free hand, materializing a massive backpack with a metal frame. Its size was such that even an average adult might struggle to pick it up and wear it, but Rebecca managed to do so with relative ease before a console with keys similar to a typewriter emerged from the mouth of the pack, followed by a pair of large mechanical arms. So Historia's armory can store the equipment and belongings of other people. Good to know. Thought Izuku, casually removing his blazer and handing it to Momo before rolling up his sleeves and manifesting his full gauntlets for his classmates to see. Then, as green electricity began to crackle around his body, his figure appeared to vanish to some before he rematerialized next to a goblin wearing wrought plate armor, backhanding the level 25 creature with enough force to cause its upper body to erupt into a fountain of blood and gore. Fortunately, before most of the blood even had a chance to hit the ground, the goblin vanished into motes of bluish-white light, awarding Izuku and Momo little more than 7,300 EXP. Seeing Izuku moving around like a blur, making short work of the group of goblins, Roman narrowed his eyes and muttered, he's quite powerful for a no-name monkey. After their previous encounter, Roman spent much of the prep time they had been given looking up information on Izuku. Much of Izuku's records had been sealed by Nizu, but as most countries kept their own detailed records of other nation citizens, Roman had ascertained that, until fairly recently, Izuku was a nobody. He guessed that Izuku had been adopted into the Yairozu family as a result of his performance at the UA Sports Festival, and based on what he was seeing right now, he couldn't fault the well-established family for their foresight. But a peasant is still a peasant. Thought Roman, imagining how he might be able to embarrass Izuku at a public gathering or one of the many balls hosted by the Royal Academy to accumulate funds. He likely wouldn't be able to convince the Yeo Yorises he was the better candidate to wed their daughter, but it didn't matter since they were from different social circles. Izuku and Momo would eventually return to the high society of Japan, so Roman felt no qualms about embarrassing them to secure his standing in the far more established circles of Europe and Great Britain. While Roman was busy scheming, Izuku managed to finish off most of the goblins on his own. Not even three minutes had transpired since Arcturus blew the horn of summoning goblin, so while others imagined how they could befriend or gain leverage against Izuku, Historia's father wore a wry smile as he thought. I don't like it, but it looks like Historia has finally met her match. At least now I understand why he's been so successful back in Japan. Recalling the names and appearances of some of the women Izuku was involved with, Arcturus closed his eyes and exhaled a sigh. He wouldn't trade his wife for the world, but he would be lying to himself if he said he wasn't at least a little envious of Izuku's power and position. As they were free to leave after the second test, Izuku exchanged contact information with Historia, Rebecca, and De Young, promising to meet the first two at the time Momo had arranged before she and him made their way to the dome-shaped bunker, 
that would serve as their residence for the foreseeable future. It resembled a silvery shield from the outside, but after passing through numerous security checkpoints, Izuku and Momo discovered that the first floor was a lounge area with a distinct Japanese feel to it, reminiscent of a Ryokan. Looks like they predict that more than just me, and you will be staying here, said Izuku, the face of Melissa appearing in his mind. However, as her father wished for her to remain in UA, where it was much safer, it was more likely that Nizu had pulled strings to arrange for Mei and potentially the Pussycats to come over. Momo was holding up for now, but she would eventually need some assistance, if she were to perform her duties as his attendant slash secretary properly. Unfortunately, after a quick look around, Izuku didn't notice any proximity markers concealed in or around the building. He and Momo seemed to be the only ones present, at least for the time being, so they spent an hour or two checking each floor to see what facilities were available. All but confirming Izuku's suspicions that others would eventually be arriving, the first floor was equipped with a large, onsen-like bath and a gym that could easily accommodate dozens of people. This included 12 treadmills and more tellingly, two locker rooms, each with five rows of 10 lockers, several of which had already been labeled with the names of students from classes 1A and 1B. I think I know where UA's next training camp is scheduled to take place, mused Momo, covering her mouth to suppress a giggle. If she were being honest, she felt nervous about it being just her and Izuku. She planned to give it her all, but there was a reason they accepted him being in multiple relationships. There were actually several, but the most pertinent, at least in this instance, was that his inordinate Shaboink drive couldn't be managed by just a single woman. Then I imagine there's a Shaboink dungeon somewhere around here, mused Izuku, grasping Momo's hand and matching her expectations by grinning as he appended, shall we search for it? Unless you want to do it here, replied Momo, feeling emboldened by the notion they were the only people present in what they would later discover was a 13-story building extending more than a hundred meters into the ground. Fortunately, while the security and surveillance system were already up and running, allowing Nizu to check in on them periodically, the locker rooms were one of several areas deliberately left untapped. While Momo propped herself up on a pillow that had been laid across his legs, straddling his torso, Izuku lightly drummed her rear, fully exposed as she sported a red lace thong. Luna has been very active in the group chat, revealed Momo, surprising Izuku as he expected her to lurk for a while before trying to make friends. Not because she was lacking in sociability, but due to the difference in her age compared to other active girls in the chat. Inferring that Izuku was surprised by the fact his hands had stopped, Momo explained, Namiri-sensei invited her to introduce herself and got everyone talking about how each of us became involved with you and our plans for the future. Things became a little chaotic when Suchikawa-sensei broached the subject of children, but they've since calmed down. Right now, everyone is talking about their work studies. Oh, anything interesting happen? Asked Izuku. He knew which agency each of the girls had joined, but due to the 13-hour time difference between New York and Japan, now reduced to 8 hours in London, he had mostly been communicating with the girls via DMs. He lurked in the group chat when he had free time, but because of how enthusiastic Toru, Toga and Ryuko got when they realized he was available, things quickly got out of hand. Everyone seems to be doing well, replied Momo. Rather because of how powerful everyone has become, they're outperforming many of the heroes they've been working for. Tsuyu and Achiko have even received invitations to become official sidekicks from Ryukyu, the No. 9 Pro Hero. Too bad I already poached them, mused Izuku, resuming his drumming of Momo's bottom. It was genuinely a sight to behold. So much so that he felt mesmerized watching the ripples of his light smacks spread through it as the fabric covering her crotch darkened from her arousal. You can spank me harder. Muttered Momo, her focus shifting from her phone and tablet. In response, Izuku gave her a crisp smack with his left hand, leaving a visible handprint that caused Momo to shudder, a stain on her panties becoming much more prominent as her breath quickened and became audible. It hadn't been long since they got out of the bath, concluding their previous session of lovemaking, but since neither of them had much else to do, they passed the time relishing each other's bodies atop a bed that was clearly intended for more than just two people to lay on. Leaving Momo to rest early, Izuku boarded the elevator that ran through the compound center, connecting all but the three bottom-most floors. Those required passing through high-security checkpoints, but it wasn't because they were secret labs or anything. The eleventh floor was a spa where Izuku and the girls could unwind and relax. As for the twelfth and thirteenth, the former was a high-tech training facility that would make a parkour artist rule, clearly intended to test air trek, while the latter was a literal nuclear bunker with an advanced air and water filtration system, a greenhouse, and ten years worth of food and medical supplies. Taking the elevator up to the first floor, 
Izuku went to the gym to pump some iron and exert himself in a way that didn't involve shabowinking someone's brains out. He was reluctant to admit it, but he had gotten used to having a lot more than just one partner, so even after going at it with Momo until she just laughed in response to his words, he had a lot of energy to spare. VZZT 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 After beating the shit out of a 2000 kilogram punching bag for the better part of an hour, Izuku was wiping the sweat from his face and body with a towel when his phone began to vibrate. Checking it, he was unsurprised to discover it was a text from Nizu. The principal never slept, so if he was at his laptop, he probably noticed him working out. Experiencing difficulties? Asked Nizu, his face appearing in Izuku's mind with a smug slash amused grin. I'm guessing the summit hasn't resumed. Asked Izuku, unwilling to admit he was feeling at least a little restless. Sadly, no. I was however, able to excuse myself from its continuance as the unexpected breach in New York was a reasonable enough justification to return to UA, answered Nizu. I saw the locker rooms, revealed Izuku, following it up by asking, what is Sensei planning? I'm fairly certain you and Yairoza-san have figured it out, responded Nizu explaining, I'm still hammering out the details, but I'm arranging a joint training camp between classes 1A and 1B at the Royal Academy. I expect that we'll be collaborating with them frequently in the future, so it would be prudent to allow the students from our respective academies to meet and mingle. I guess that makes me the liaison, asked Izuku, imagining Nizu laughing before he answered, that is correct. With that in mind, please attempt to avoid creating too hostile an environment with the students of the night course. I don't imagine they'll afford you the same courtesy, but you're a mature and capable young man. Don't let the words and actions of those who will forever remain in your shadow hinder your progress. I understand, Sensei, replied Izuku, and he mostly meant it. He expected that Roman and his cronies would eventually make a move, but so long as they didn't touch or cross his bottom line, he would treat it as water under the bridge. Now back to my previous question, said Nizu, following it up by asking, are you experiencing difficulties? The facility urine requires at least one adult per 15 students and an on-site medical officer, so I was thinking about sending Namuri sensei over to get caught up on European history and teach a class related to artifacts. Though he was tempted to ask why Nizu would send Namuri sensei and not someone like Ryuko, Izuku already knew the answer. He and Midnight had yet to shaboink, but she was undoubtedly one of the most qualified to handle his urges. Ryuko and the Pussycats were required to prepare the students of classes 1A and 1B for the breaches, while Mirko, Izuku's preferred choice, lacked the qualifications to oversee such a large facility. And that was ignoring the fact she was pregnant with his child, a fact that would invariably come to light in such a hostile environment. I'll defer to Sensei's judgment, responded Izuku. His ideal scenario was that everyone came over together, including his mom and Eri, but Izuku knew that the literal fortress that was UA was infinitely more secure than the open and accessible grounds of the Royal Academy. He could keep them in the bunker, but living 24-7 in an underground facility was bound to have consequences. Then you should anticipate her arrival in the next two to three days, responded Nizu. As for the joint training camp, it will most likely take place over the winter break. That way, you can spend the new year with those you care about. Witnessing Izuka's reaction through a computer monitor, Nizu spared him the effort of needing to respond by typing, you need not thank me. I pledge to support you to the best of my ability, and I have never willfully reneged on a promise. All Midori Akuin needs to focus on is your mental health and becoming as powerful as possible. Sensei will handle the rest. Adopting a faint smile and exhaling through his nose, Izuka responded with a curt, I understand. He wanted to thank Nizu for everything he had and would likely do for him in the future, but since the person himself told him not to, Izuku kept his gratitude in his heart, spending another hour or two exercising before returning to his room on the 10th floor to take a cold shower and join Momo in bed. With the previous day's test continuing into the second, as Arcturus had run out of mana, Izuku and Momo were welcome to come and watch the other students but were not required to do so. The actual teachers of the class were intended to be Tashinori and Britain's No. 4 Hero Legion, but as the former was still in America and the latter was helping to clear a B-rank breach, things wouldn't officially kick off until they arrived. Since they basically had two to three days of free time, Izuku allowed Momo to contact Historia and let her know he was free. In her response, Historia asked if she could bring Rebecca over to explore the mysterious facility that was among the hottest topics in the academy, so Izuku spent an hour or two showing them around before they gathered in a traditional, Japanese-style dining room for lunch. This place is quite large for just two people, Historia remarked, 
a piece of rice adorning her cheek as she had engorged herself on nearly a dozen back-to-back. -back. Following Historia's words, Rebecca dutifully wiped her mouth with an embroidered handkerchief before putting it away and meeting Izuku's expression with a helpless, slightly embarrassed smile. Fortunately, the latter was fairly good at pretending he hadn't seen anything, his smile showing no changes as he relaxedly explained, it might be just the two of us right now, but the facility was constructed to comfortably house all the students of UA's hero and support programs. It's doubtful they'll ever come over all at once, but my sensei, Principal Nizu, lives by the principle that it's better to be over than underprepared. A noble sentiment, affirmed Historia, nodding in approval. Then, even though she was enjoying herself quite a bit, she rose to her feet, adding, On that note, there are places Rebecca and I need to be in matters for us to attend. Thank you, Sir Midoriya, for granting us a private tour of your facility. Truth be told, it was a little jarring witnessing how state-of-the-art your equipment and facilities are compared to our own, but I suppose that is to be expected from the No. 1 School for Heroics. Well you're free to stop by and make use of them whenever you please, responded Izuku, rising to his feet with the intention of escorting Historia and Rebecca to the front entrance. The former smiled as if she thought he was simply being polite, but Rebecca's eyes sparkled as she asked, does that include the production facilities on the seventh floor? Nodding in affirmation, Izuku explained, I've already registered the two of your biometric data to the security system. Most of the facilities can't legally be operated without a supervising adult on the premises, but one is scheduled to arrive in the next day or two. After that, you're welcome to come go, and even pick out a room if you want to. I've already received permission from the principal, and I doubt the headmaster would oppose the idea. I'm not so sure. Replied Historia, a somewhat awkward smile adorning her face as she supplanted. My father is very protective. I was a bit too trusting when I was younger and ended up in a predicament that caused considerable stress for my family and loved ones. He has permitted me to move more freely in the past few months, but I'm not sure if he would allow me to reside somewhere other than our estate. Nonetheless, the offer remains, replied Izuku, maintaining a smile as he escorted the two girls to the lobby. He doubted Arcturus would be happy to learn that he had invited Historia to take up residence in the compound, but after their private discussion the previous day, Izuku was fairly certain he would agree. Where things went from there, only fate and perhaps the goddess who sent him to the world of BNHA knew. In the wake of Historia's and Rebecca's departure, Izuku was pressing weights in the gym with Momo sitting atop him when she said, Namiri sensei asked me to ask you if she should bring Takiyama sensei with her when she comes over. Recalling that Takiyama, MT lady, was one of the candidates to become the leader of the special task force, Izuku took a moment to finish off his current set before racking the weights and asking, what do you think? At this rate, I'm better off deferring to you and the others rather than making such decisions for myself. Since it was much too late to make the case he wasn't a Shaboink crazed idiot, Izuku decided to simply go with the flow after the incident with Luna and Momo suggesting they recruit Historia. He wouldn't just Shaboink any woman that appeared before him, but if it furthered his goal of preserving the world and protecting the people he cared about, he certainly wasn't going to not Shaboink world-class beauties like MT Lady. Then I'll see what the others have to say before giving the go-ahead or refusing the suggestion, replied Momo, tapping away on her phone even as she spoke. His bulge pressing against her but was a slight distraction, but she did her best to appear calm and professional-like as Izuku began a new set. Waiting until Izuku racked his weights a second time, Momo revealed, the votes are 11 for and 2 against. Ryuko and Rumi are the two who voted against, and Mei, Achiko, and Tsuyu abstained. Imagining Ryuko throwing a fit and Rumi pouting, a smile developed across Izuku's face. Then, as Rumi was undeniably his number one, he caused Momo's brows to rise as he remarked, If Rumi is against it, it's best if Namuri sensei comes alone. I feel sorry if Takiyama-san was a part of the vote, but I can't forget my priorities. She was, but I'm certain she will understand, replied Momo. This was the exact opposite of what happened, as Takiyama immediately began arguing with a very smug Rumi but Momo felt no need to inform Izuku of the drama his words had provoked. In the end, it didn't matter as Namuri was eventually able to convince Rumi to let you, Takiyama, accompany her for Izuku's sake. She had already won by Izuku making it clear he valued her opinion more than everyone else's, so, during the private conversation that followed, Namuri had little trouble convincing Rumi that she would be being magnanimous by permitting you to experience Izuku's capabilities for herself. September 7, 2149 Staring at a military helicopter as it landed next to the shield compound, Izuku was unsurprised but glad when the cabin door slid open, followed by Mei hopping out, striking a pose, 
pointing at him, and grinning from ear to ear as she shouted, You there with a massive rod. Point me to the nearest baby-making facility. It's good to see you too, Mei. Replied Izuku, reciprocating the salmon-haired girl's embrace when she approached and gave him a tight squeeze. She also seized the opportunity to lick his neck before pulling away and staring at him with a disproving look as she stated, You've been slacking off. I don't detect so much as an iota of oil or grease in your sweat. Raising his brows, Izuku feigned shock as he asked, You wanted me to make babies without you? MMM. Good point. May acknowledged, followed by not so discreetly grabbing his rod through his pants, licking her lips in an overtly arousing manner, and suggesting, Let's get started immediately. First things first. Said Izuku, smiling wryly as he stared past Mei at the trio of women that had disembarked the helicopter in her wake. The first two were Namuri and Yu, looking decidedly more rejuvenated than Izuku remembered, while the last member of their group was a woman he didn't recognize until reading her name. Name, Anan Kuro's title party invitation required quirk, black hole bond level, 74 current level, 23 effective level, 52 attributes strength, 28 agility, 35 Vitality, 325 Intelligence, 61 Dexterity, 26 Luck, 49 Free Attributes, 110 Perks Party Invitation Required. So this is what she looks like under her spacesuit. Thought Izuku, his eyes widening as he never expected Space Hero, 13 to be among the teachers dispatched. She had a somewhat boyish appearance with hazel eyes and short, navy blue hair with blonde highlights that followed a swirl pattern from her scalp. She was also quite tall standing at 180 centimeters, and while she was a bit lacking in femininity compared to Namuri and Yu, he could tell she had been training hard to increase her strength and improve her physique. Since Izuku was staring directly at her, Ainan raised her gloved, valve-tipped hand, a timid smile adorning her face as she said, Yo. Long time no see, Midoriya kun. Oh come on Kuro-san. You need to be more confident, stated Yu, exuding vanity and a hint of derision as she mused, getting all nervous when your opponent is just a student is silly. Shifting her distinctive purple eyes to Izuku, you crossed her arms in a way that emphasized her well-shaped but uncharacteristically modest melons as she adopted an alluringly pouty expression and remarked, You know Izuku-kun, you gave me a real fright when you left my fate in the hands of that roomie. It almost made me think you didn't like me anymore. Instead of feeding into Yu's bullshit, Izuku asked, Did the two of you use Zeri's power? You look less like teachers and more like students. Wow, you must really be a super fan to notice such a small change so quickly. Exclaimed you, clapping her hands together. In reality, she was the most different of everyone present as everything from her height to the proportions of her butt, waist and melons had changed. Rather than the 23-year-old she was supposed to be, she looked closer to 16 to 18. As for Namuri, her proportions hadn't changed much, but she was noticeably more supple in certain areas the result of regressing from 31 to around 23. She had also cut her hair. Name, Namuri Kiyama title, Tempting Teacher, Bond plus 20, Vit plus 50, Luck plus 50 Quirk, Somnambulist Bond Level, 100 Current Level, 33 Effective Level, 58, Attributes Strength, 33 Agility, 39 Vitality, 169 Intelligence, 110 Dexterity, 105 Luck, 205 Free Attributes, 30 Perks, Healthy Body, Pheromone Control, Synesthesia. Name, Yutakiyama Title Party Invitation Required Quirk, Gigantification Bond Level, 56 Current Level, 31 Effective Level, 59, Attribute Strength, 32 Agility, 35 Vitality, 341 Intelligence, 49 Dexterity, 37 Luck, 94 Free Attributes, 155, Perks Party Invitation Required. How is it? Does it suit me? asked Namuri, holding her hands up to her hair. Long hair got in the way of many things, so she had cut it short to match the style she wore when she was still active. Absolutely, Izuku affirmed, his expression serious as he nodded for effect. His apparent disregard caused Yu's brow to twitch, but she just squeezed her melons together even more and asked, And what about me? Arent ikuta tilde. Plenty, replied Izuku, adopting a somewhat awkward smile as he added, so cut it out with a try-hard act, would you? I'm starting to empathize with the saying that you should never meet your heroes. Dropping her act, Yu's expression became markedly more neutral as she flatly remarked, Well, aren't you mature? Sorry if I upset you, but try and see things from my perspective, okay? I understand our predicament and definitely want to become stronger, 
but being assigned as Sheboink Relief for a high schooler isn't exactly how I imagined my career evolving. Well, I'm not going to force you, replied Izuku, shrugging as he added, though as it stands, I can't invite you to my party and boost your stats. Your bond level is only 56. Waving her hand dismissively, you asserted, eh, if you're half as capable as Rumi and the other girls claim you to be, that won't be an issue. Just no but stuff, okay? My costume draws a lot of attention to my Giat, so I don't need it leaking or showing through. Okay, replied Izuku, his expression moderately incredulous, as he was a bit more pragmatic than he anticipated. He was tempted to point out she could change her costume from beige to black, saving her a lot of trouble, but it was fairly obvious why she had chosen a bodysuit whose tint nearly matched her skin tone. It drew a lot of attention. Okay, that's enough chatter, said Namuri, tossing a duffel bag filled with more than just clothes at Izuku and suggesting, let's head inside. I want to get a feel for the premises and pick my room. After that, it's high time I gave you a personal lesson. Look forward to it. I have been for a while, replied Izuku, causing Namuri to exhale a deep-throated laugh. Their flirtatious exchange caused Yu's bond level to drop by one, as she was a fairly vain woman, but once Izuku started giving her the attention she craved, it would invariably shoot up like a rocket. In fact, before her spat with Rumi, it had been a commendable 81, courtesy of the girls sharing nearly naked photos of him. Izuku just needed to take off his clothes, and her bond level would take care of itself. So what's the deal with your and Takayama-san's appearances? Asked Izuku, standing behind Namuri and slowly peeling away her clothes while Momo was away, helping you and Ainan get settled by utilizing her quirk to provide anything they needed. You're a smart boy, replied Namuri, leaning her head back to look up at Izuku with narrowed eyes as she said, Guess. Hmm. The simplest explanation is that you were asked to assist with Eri's training, but that doesn't explain the drastic changes in Takiyama-san's appearance. Itsuku konjekchat. Unless, of course, Eri made a mistake. But I don't think that's it. Then what do you think? Asked Namuri, a pleasant smell filling the air and her smile becoming increasingly alluring as Izuku began fondling her exposed melons. I think the principal convinced the two of you to revert to when you were still virgins. Izuku whispered, putting a bit of force into his hands, an act that caused Namuri to wince, bite her lip, and issue a throaty moan as she instinctually nestled her rear against his bulge. Then, instead of confirming if Izuku had guessed correctly, she stared at him with narrowed eyes and purred, you'll have to confirm it for yourself. Before licking her lips in a way that gave him goosebumps, recovering from his momentary stupor, Izuku returned a smile, released his hold on the Muri, and stepped away to admire her form, clad in nothing but a pair of black side-tie string panties as he replied, I'd rather have Sensei show me herself. I thought you might. Muset Nemuri, you sure took your time. I was starting to think you wouldn't show, said you, lying on her stomach and facing away from the door, focusing on her phone as Izuku entered her room. She was wearing a purple lace teabag and a matching brassiere, but her lackluster reaction and body language made it seem like she had no interest in what was to come. Understanding that you just wanted him to want her, even before Namuri offered her advice, Izuku approached and climbed onto the bed without speaking. Then, after crawling on top of her, straddling her butt, he put his dexterous fingers to work by massaging her. Hmm. And here I thought you would pounce on me like an aroused dog, remarked you, tossing aside her phone and crossing her forearms under her chin. She was of the same mind as most of the women Izuku shabowinked, believing his quirk compelled him to pursue it, so his kicking things off with a massage was a pleasant surprise. Instead of responding to Yu's provocations, Izuku spent several minutes easing the tension in her body before breaking his silence by remarking, I was surprised when you appeared in this form. Your appearance as MT Lady has become iconic, but I actually followed you before your debut in Mizutafu. Hearing Izuku's admission, you tensed. Most people didn't know she had a career and persona before her debut as MT Lady. If Izuku was telling the truth, it didn't really matter in the grand scheme, but you felt embarrassed. After all, the reason she had to rebrand herself and debut a second time was because her initial transition from a sidekick to a pro was a disaster. Adding insult to injury but also making you feel gratified, Izuku asked, If I get Momo to recreate your original outfit, will you wear it? It might not be as eye-catching as your current costume, but there's a reason people say cuteness is justice. Can you not? You responded, but despite the bite in her tone, there was no real anger. If anything, she felt ashamed, as she had spent a fortune to become the person others knew as MT Lady. 
Hearing someone like Izuku compliment her original appearance. It stung. I'm the type that always speaks his mind. Asserted Izuku, running his thumbs from the base of Yu's spine to her neck, a maneuver that required him to lean forward, his bulge pressing against her modest but perky rear for effect. Izuku would be lying if he said he didn't prefer his women with a bit of meat on their bones, but he also didn't think someone should have to undergo plastic surgery or have their physical appearance permanently altered to appeal to others. Yu's reverted physique was closer to Kyuka's than the natural pillowiness of someone like Toru, but being slender and toned wasn't without its charms. Feeling Izuku's purportedly massive rod pressing against her butt, the rosy hue bleeding into Yu's face deepened as her bond level increased nearly as fast as a standard count. She was weak to praise regarding her looks, as before becoming empty lady, she rarely received any. Afterward, she always felt like she was deceiving people, so while you relish the attention her empty lady person warranted her, it never filled the emptiness that came from discarding her original self in favor of wagging her behind for a bunch of paparazzi and perverts. Hammering one final nail into the proverbial coffin, Izuku slid his hands to Yu's waist, rising onto his knees and propping up her but as he remarked, and since I'm speaking my mind, I'd like to see you with your natural hair color at some point. You were right to choose blonde to complement your outfit and garner attention, but teal is close to green. If my costume didn't make it apparent, I'm fairly partial to the color. Without waiting for Yu's response, Izuku slid down her undies and began eating her out. He hadn't exactly come there to make conversation, but since Namiri had asked him to see if there was anything he could do to get you to be more accepting of herself, he laid it on a little thick but made sure to include his honest thoughts. He would never think to force any of his women to change, so if he was going to be his, he wanted the real her, not the persona and appearance she had crafted to please others. Reclining against Izuku in the bath, you had a listless look as she stared at her status, now visible thanks to her being a member of his party. Her 49 intelligence annoyed her, but the number made sense when she recalled all the mistakes she had made throughout her life. What should I do? Asked you, leaning her head against Izuku's chest and closing her eyes as she added, I never really got into gaming, so I'm not sure if I should boost my intelligence or go all in on luck to make leveling easier. Luck has effects other than just boosting the amount of experience you gain, explained Izuku. People with naturally high luck aren't just those with inordinate talent. Those born beautiful or into wealthy families also have high luck. It directly affects how others perceive you and how you perceive yourself, so it's an investment that affects every aspect of your life and dash before Izuku could finish, use expression and tone hardened as she said, do it. The rest of my stats can be improved later. Right now, luck is what I need the most. Nodding in affirmation, Izuku helped you invest all 155 of her free AP into luck, bringing it to 255. Its original value was 94, which was fairly high on its own, but after they shabowinked, it had increased to 101. Thus, after picking her perks, Yu's status looked like this. Name, Yutakiyama title, the Jiyat that eclipses the sun, Vit plus 100 quirk, gigantification bond level, 88 current level, 31 effective level, 59 to 85, attributes strength, 32 agility, 35 vitality, 341 to 442 intelligence, 49 dexterity, 37 luck, 94 to 255 free attributes, 0 perks, healthy body, partial transformation, lucky, partial transformation. The user can freely control the size and shape of individual body parts. Feeling Yu's rear and thighs abruptly inflate, Izuku raised his brows and remarked, I see you're already working on improving and mastering your partial transformation. How diligent. Ignoring Izuku's comment, you, somewhat exasperated, asserted, your quirk really is a cheat. I've spent years trying to learn how to control the size of my gigantification quirk, but it's always zero or one hundred. Now I just have to think about it, and my body changes as I want it to. Holding up her right hand, you willed it to become slightly bigger before immediately returning it to normal. She also experimented with inflating her melons and overall body size, but eventually returned to her normal proportions. Well, mostly. Since she had a nonsensical title like the Jiyat that eclipses the sun, she figured she might as well afford herself thicker thighs and a bubble butt. Deciding that she wanted to experiment a bit in private, you leaned her head back and said, we should wrap things up so you can visit Kurosan. I can't speak for others, but I certainly didn't enjoy waiting for you to arrive. Well you're welcome to come straight to my room in the future, replied Izuku, wrapping his arms around Yu's stomach and kissing the top of her head as he added, it beats sleeping alone. Though she would ordinarily refuse such a request, 
you knew she didn't have the leeway to be selfish in her relationship with Izuku. Unless she wanted to become a side piece, playing second fiddle or third clarinet to women like Rumi, she would need to be at least a little proactive. Fine, replied you. But due to the differences in our ages, I'm not really comfortable with the idea of sharing a bed with the younger girls you're involved with. Namuri and the Pussycats are fine, but I don't want to lose face by having to compete with your classmates. I can empathize with that, but it feels a little strange hearing you say it with your current form. Replied Itsuku. He didn't know what age you had reverted to, but she could easily pass for a first year. In fact, he was fairly certain that was what Nizu had in mind when he permitted her to utilize Eri's power. If you disguised herself as a maid or became a student of the servant course, there was a good chance she would be allowed to enter the breaches with him, reducing their individual experience but increasing their gains overall. Well strange or not, that's how it is, contended you. Then, rising from the tub, providing Izuku a first-person perspective of her noticeably fuller butt and thighs, she carefully wrung the water from her hair as she appended. As for the whole wanting to see my natural hair color, I'll ask Yayoroza san if she can make some hair dye remover. If she can't, you should order a few bottles and have them shipped over, or go pick some up from a local salon. The inside of my crotch currently feels like sandpaper, so there's no way I'm going out. Then make sure to get plenty of rest, said Izuku, his voice low and filled with affection as he embraced you from behind. Her face flushed slightly in response, but due to years of cultivating a vain and somewhat shameless persona, she brushed off her embarrassment by remarking, Wow look at you, acting all concerned. You must have really fallen for me, huh? Instead of refuting Yu's words, Izuku softly mused, You're not wrong. Before putting a bit of strength into his arms, cradling the petite heroine for several seconds before kissing the top of her head and releasing her to retrieve a towel. I feel deceived. Bamboozled, even. Remarked Izuku, his expression one of genuine awe as he pulled the fabric of Ainan's baggy shirt taut so that it adhered to the contours of her body. Her choice of clothes made it seem like she had a pear-shaped body, but the eye-popping reality was that her figure was nearly on par with Toru's. Adopting a neutral smile that didn't quite reach her eyes, Ainan calmly replied, I appreciate the compliment, but you don't need to bother trying to butter me up. No offense to you, but I'm not really interested in things like this. Since Ainan was the one who had invited him to sit down before climbing on top of him, Izuku couldn't help raising his brows as he remarked, We don't have to do this if it makes you uncomfortable. Not to boast, but I'm not exactly hurting for bed companions. I'm fine if you want to be friends or something similar. I appreciate your concern, but while I have little interest in intimacy, this is something I decided for myself. Replied Ainan, smiling relaxedly as she unhurriedly unbuttoned her shirt. Mind if I ask the reason? Asked Izuku, tentatively sliding his hands to Ainan's jiat and internally marveling at how soft it was. He was tempted to give it a squeeze but restrained himself to await Ainan's answer. MMM. You could say it's something along the lines of peer pressure, but no one forced me to come. Replied Ainan, her expression softening into a demure slightly embarrassed look as she explained, I guess I just didn't want to be left out. Though he didn't approve of her reason, Izuku decided not to call Ainan out or spurn the convictions that had brought her there. It couldn't have been easy for her to overcome her discomfort and expose herself in such a vulnerable manner. So once the final button of her shirt was undone, he asked, Can I kiss you? In a faint, gentle tone. Sure, replied Ainan, her smile gaining a hint of wryness as she remarked, Maybe it will help to soothe my nerves. Resisting the urge to point out she looked completely calm, Izuku slipped his hands into Ainan's shirt, embracing her bare back as he drew her close for a chaste kiss. When he withdrew, the front of her shirt opened to reveal her sizable bust, her melons looking like they might burst forth from the fabric of her gray sports bra. But instead of looking down and gawking as he had before, Izuku held Ainan's gaze, smiling as he asked, How do you want to do this? Like this is fine. I like to be held. Replied Ainan, feeling more at ease due to how patient and understanding Izuku was behaving. She wouldn't have resisted even if he pushed her down and ravished her without mercy, but if he were always this gentle, she might not mind shabowinking in the future. It was certainly preferable to how her one and only past boyfriend treated her. With such thoughts in mind, Ainan closed her eyes as Izuku leaned in for another kiss, enjoying the feeling of his warm hands caressing her back without any sense of urgency. It gave the impression that, until she was ready, Izuku wouldn't take things a step further. Thus, as seconds turned to minutes, the anxious tension in Ainan's body gradually melted away, 
her somewhat frigid body warming and becoming increasingly relaxed as she leaned into Izuku's embrace. As he truly wasn't in a hurry, Izuku made out with Ainan for nearly 20 minutes, even exchanging a bit of saliva, before she took the initiative to pull away and say, You don't need to hold yourself back on my account. If you're struggling or feeling stifled, we should move on. We'll move on when you're ready, replied Izuku, adopting a sincere and affectionate smile as he slid his hands to Ainan's lower back and said, I'm enjoying every second of this. With her bond level increasing from a fairly high 74 she started with to 79, Ainan's smile gained a hint of appreciation as she said, You're a good person Midoriya-kun. Then getting off of him, she turned around and shimmied out of her pants, revealing and but just as amazing as her chest. Her plain grey underwear wasn't very appealing, but Izuka didn't have to look at them for long as, after a moment of hesitation, Ainan peeled them off and tossed them onto her pants. Feeling a little anxious, as she had never been the one to initiate, Ainan swallowed nervously before turning to face Izuku, forcing a smile as she asked, Should I remove my shirt and bra? I wouldn't mind, but only if you want to. Replied Izuku, maintaining an affectionate smile as he watched Ainan return a nod before mustering the courage to remove everything but the gloves that kept her exceptionally dangerous quirk in check. She really was a spectacular beauty, so he let her know it, muttering, Incredible. In a faint, awe-filled tone. Smiling awkwardly, Ainan hugged herself as a self-soothing gesture and asked, Are you going to remove your pants, or do you want me to do it? I'm fine either way, but if you want, I could give you a show, proposed Izuku. He could tell Ainan had regained her nervousness, so if he could lighten the mood by embarrassing himself, he didn't mind. He was a lucky bastard who had monopolized all the girls and was now moving on to his female teachers. It was a little late for him to pretend he had even an iota of shame. Blinking in surprise, Ainan parroted, a show, while turning her head to the side. When she eventually realized Izuku was referring to giving her a strip tease, a slightly amused smile adorned Ainan's face as she shook her head and replied, some other time perhaps, before lowering herself to her knees and helping him to remove his pants and briefs. Name, Ainan Kuro's title, Black Hole Bombshell, Vitality plus 100 Quirk, Black Hole Bond Level, 92 Current Level, 23 Effective Level, 73 Attributes Strength, 28 Agility, 35 Vitality, 325 to 425 Intelligence, 61 to 100 Dexterity, 26 Luck, 49 to 120 Free Attributes, 0 Perks, Healthy Body, Ergokinetic Suppression, Ergokinetic Suppression. The user can suppress the energy within their body and suppress the power of others via direct contact. This is incredible. Muttered Ainan, her voice quivering slightly as she stared at her hands presently absent the gloves she had worn for much of her life. It wasn't that she couldn't take them off before, but since her fingers released radiation even when her quirk wasn't active, she had to remove them in a special containment chamber when she wanted to clean or swap them out. Well, you deserve it. Affirmed Izuku, sitting behind Ainan as he enjoyed his fourth bath for the day. She was a bit reluctant to join him initially, but once they got in the tub and began perusing the list of perks, the tensions in her body eased as she relaxed against him. Adopting a somewhat dreamy-eyed expression, Ainan closed her eyes and allowed her body to go limp against Izuku as she muttered, I understand now why so many women are smitten with you. This is the first time we're interacting outside a professional or school setting, and I already feel like I'm falling in love. Well, if you do decide to fall for me, know that I'll do everything I can to make you happy. Replied Izuku, wrapping his arms around Ainan's body and cradling her gently. She cracked her eyes in response, but instead of saying anything, she placed her hands over Izuku's, enjoying the feeling of touching someone directly for the first time in 25 years. As Narumi's Yu's and Ainan's internal clocks were still operating on Japanese Standard Time, which was 8 hours ahead of London's, Izuku left them to rest and chat among themselves after everyone but May ate a meal together. Momo later informed him during his fifth bath that the group chat had practically exploded after the girls shared their testimonials, but before that, Izuku spent much of the afternoon and evening making babies with Mei in the seventh floor's production facility. Though she still had a ways to go before she caught up with Melissa, Mei's talents had blossomed with functionally limitless resources and access to Shield Industries' most secure servers. With the seventh floor even having its own supercomputer, Mei was like a tiger given wings as she worked on the prototype of one of the many ads Izuku had pitched to her and Melissa in the past. She loved the idea of heroes skating around and performing sick tricks and aerial maneuvers. So when Melissa left for America, May took it upon herself to start prototyping the gem and water regalius. Unfortunately, 
as the only memory Izuku had to go on for the water regalia was that it used a similar principle to water jet cutting to create compressed air bubbles that exploded when burst, the design Mei came up with was more like water-powered rocket boots. They would mess up anything unfortunate enough to get caught in their path, but unless you carried around a massive tank of water to power them, they weren't very practical. They did however, put tremendous strain on the wearer's glutes and thighs, so if you trained with them consistently, you'd end up with an amazing set of both. With the school emailing them the previous night, Izuku and Momo were to report to the amphitheater by 8am, but not before the former greeted the day by making gentle yet passionate love to Ainan in the shower. She had volunteered herself for morning duty, so not only had she arrived at 5.30 to wake him with a BJ, she even helped him put on his uniform and ensured he properly brushed his teeth after he cream-pied her no less than four times. Be safe, and try not to get into any quarrels with the other students of the night course. Said Ainan her voice low and serene as she shared one final hug with Izuku before he and Momo departed. I'll do what I can. Replied Izuku, punctuating his words with a fleetingly chaste kiss, followed by a meaningful exchange of glances before he and Ainan finally separated. You and Kuro-sensei appear to be getting along splendidly, noted Momo, waiting until she and Izuku were outside the compound before broaching the subject with a smile. Even I'm surprised by how amazing she is, replied Izuku and he meant it. He still remembered the first impression he had of Ainan, that she was a bit lacking in femininity compared to Namuri and Yu, but she was a gentle, caring, and incredibly diligent woman beneath her veneer of placidity. The fact she was 29 and had nearly given up on finding someone to share her life with made him want to track down whoever hurt her and break every bone in their body. Proving that she was getting to know Izuku a little too well, Momo smiled knowingly and revealed. The principal asked me to tell you that the man who abused Kuro's sensei has already received a just punishment. While he never went to prison, he sustained grave life-altering injuries during an incident where Kuro's sensei's quirk went out of control. Though it felt strange to hear Momo talking about someone potentially losing their dong with a smile on her face, Izuku couldn't resist adopting one himself. He might be a bastard who sleeps with tens of women, but he would never harm any of them willfully, especially in cases like Ainan a woman who seemed to radiate mommy energy from the very core of her being. She deserved to be loved, and if she allowed him to, he would give her more than even her quirk could swallow. Arriving at the amphitheater around 20 minutes before they needed to be there, Izuku and Momo discovered that a trio of military-grade tilt-rotor aircraft resembling Ospreys were idling in the arena. Only a handful of their fellow students were present, but there was a substantial number of perfectly identical individuals running around. A man with wild, maroon-red hair and a red and black hero costume consisting of padded, lightly armored pants, white boots that appeared to be made from the same materials as Mirko's, and a high-collared sleeveless vest that exposed his muscular arms, flowing into maroon gauntlets. Name Henry Charles Churchill title Meat Grinder, Vit Plus 100 Quirk, Fission Bond Level, 61 Current Level, 88 Effective Level, 2273, Attributes Strength, 118 Agility, 93 Vitality, 1791 intelligence, 81 dexterity, 115 luck, 75 free attributes, 125 perks sturdy, iron will, mind link, skills, rallying cry, crushing blow, qigong strike, sedata skin shed, blood rage. Noticing Izuku and Momo, one of the identical men, bearing the number 19 on his chest, jogged over to them, smiling as he said, you must be the exchange students, Izuku Midoriya and Momo Yairozu. I see you're the type that likes to be punctual or early. Excellent. Returning a smile, Izuka replied, and you must be Sir Henry Churchill the No. Four Hero, Legion. It's an honor to meet you, sir. Waving his hand dismissively, Henry exuded the same manic gallantry as Tashinori as he loudly asserted, no need to be overly formal. Then with a massive grin, he explained, you see, I'm not officially a teacher of the Royal Academy. I was mainly hired because my quirk fission, allows me to supervise and assess multiple groups at the same time. So there's no need to get yourselves bent out of shape trying to butter up to me. Where we're going, the only points that matter are your level and attributes. I'll keep that in mind, replied Izuku. Then, as Historia was waving him over, he politely excused himself before approaching the petite blonde and her even more diminutive best friend, greeting them with a smile and a casual, Good morning, Arthur Bedivere. And what a morning it is, exclaimed Historia surprising Izuku a bit as she stepped toward him, hands behind her back and sporting a sparkle-eyed smile as she revealed, I discussed what we talked about last time with my father, and he said yes. If the offer stands, 
Becky and I can move into UA's ambassadorial compound as early as today. Though permitting Historia and Rebecca to move into the compound would invariably restrict his activities, at least for a short while, Izuku didn't hesitate to nod responding, then we'll inform the supervisor so they can make the necessary arrangements. Though whether you can move in today will likely hinge on where these tilt rotors take us. I can't imagine the academy prepared them to provide a campus tour. Following a light chuckle, Historia readily revealed, these heliplanes are for use by students above level 30. There are a handful of C and B rank breaches nearby that have had most of their readily accessible resources stripped, and it will be our duty to close them. In other words, it won't take that long to clear them, concluded Izuku, earning an affirming nod as Historia replied, that is correct. The board wishes to play it safe until the median level in the class is 50. After that, only those who show real results will have the chance to continue in the program. The Knights of the Round? asked Izuku, prompting Historia's smile to broaden, but she remained silent. Only a handful of high-ranking people knew about the round table that was basically being built around her, so she smoothly changed the subject, asking, back to the previous topic, is it okay if my governess moves with us into the ambassadorial compound? She is my swordsmanship instructor, confidant, and the person entrusted with my education until the beginning of this year. Even now, she teaches me many things. Since he still wasn't sure about pursuing Historia, Izuku once again nodded without hesitation responding, of course. There is actually a time when I thought to learn swordsmanship, so maybe she can give me some pointers. Hearing that Izuku was interested in learning swordsmanship, Historia's eyes glistened with magical energy and excitement. At her side, Rebecca immediately cupped her forehead, running her hand down her face as she sighed and muttered, he really said the one thing he shouldn't have. Exhibiting the reason for Rebecca's exasperation, Historia grasped Azuka's hands, a glimmer of obsession in her radiant green eyes as she practically exclaimed, please permit me to join Sir Midoriya in his chivalrous pursuit. Individually we may be lacking, but if we hone our skills together, we can attain the pinnacle of knighthood. All right, she's a chivalry-obsessed Chuyuni. Remembered Izuku, albeit a little late. Now unless he retracted his words or spurned her outright, it was likely that a substantial portion of his free time would be dedicated to honing his swordsmanship and sparring. However, as that wasn't actually a bad thing, he only hesitated for a moment before responding, I have no desire to attain the pinnacle of knighthood, but if training together might help you reach it, I'd be happy to accompany you. Feeling such excitement that her hair began to stir as if blown by a gentle breeze, her mana beginning to surge outward, Historia tightened her hold on Izuka's hands and exclaimed, It's a promise. Though Izuku waved to Dae-young when he appeared, the Korean youth looked away from him in favor of walking over and joining the group of a certain pink-haired Taiko. This prompted Izuka's brows to rise, but as he couldn't live Dae-young's life or make decisions for him, he just shook his head and decided to see how things played out. As Dae-young was the last to arrive, Henry exclaimed, Excellent. Now that everyone's present, I'll give a quick introduction and then we can get this dog and pony show on the road. Striking a crab pose that caused three other versions of himself to pop out, forming his own Super Sentai formation, the four Henrys exclaimed, We are Legion! in concert. It was honestly kind of cheesy, but as it was intended to promote to young children, Henry didn't mind the class's non-existent response as the version of him with the number one on his chest relaxed his posture and explained, At least that's why I go by in the field. Here in class, feel free to call me Sir Churchill. I would say to address me as Henry, but that would be a slight against Her Majesty. Gesturing with his thumb toward one of the heliplanes, Henry added, I'm guessing you all want to know what these bad boys are for, right? Well, I'll tell you. Those of you above level 30 will be split into groups to finish off a few C-rank breaches we left open to ensure each of you can acquire a status board. Those above level 50 who already have a status board will be entering a B-rank breach along with yours truly. As for the rest of you, you'll be spending this, and every other morning until you reach level 30, fighting goblins. Before anyone could ask, another version of Henry pulled out what looked like a crystal ball explaining, as for how we'll determine your levels, we'll be using this, a fairly common artifact called a beginner's crystal ball. If someone below level 100 places their hand on it, it can approximate their level, attributes, and things like their type and the purity of mana flowing through their bodies. Spinning the crystalline sphere atop his finger, Henry's smile broadened as he asked, now, any volunteers? You also have the option to wait and do a private reading later, but if you're obsessed with keeping secrets at your current levels, you'll have a hard time finding allies. Raising her hand Historia, to no one's surprise, confidently exclaimed, 
I volunteer myself. Sure, replied Henry, casually tossing the sphere to Historia as he added, You're one of the few who didn't need to take this test, but I won't stop you if you want to show off to your peers. You're more than qualified to do so. Though she didn't approve of the insinuation she was trying to show off, Historia didn't contest Henry's words. Instead, she closed her eyes and focused on the crystal ball in her hands, a faint white light appearing in its depths, rapidly growing in intensity before it promptly shattered, splitting into several large chunks. Opening her eyes in shock, a wave of panic washed over Historia, quickly replaced by confusion as Henry exhaled a raucous barrel-chested laugh. Once everyone's gazes were invariably drawn toward him, he wiped away a non-existent tear from his eye and explained. And that's what happens if someone with power beyond level 100 attempts to use it. Thus, for the sake of the school budget, Historia Pendragon, Rebecca Schneider, Izuku Midoriya, Momo Yayorozu, and Hande Jung are exempted from having their statuses evaluated. Pulling out a second sphere, Henry enjoyed the deadpan that developed across Historia's face as he asked, Now that the practice demonstration is over, anyone else want to try? I'll go! shouted a girl with short, somewhat wild bluish-black hair that transitioned into a faint purple color near her fringe. She was short and had green eyes with distinctive white pupils, but her most standout feature, given the situation, was that she was adorned in the attire of a service course student. As for her master, it was none other than Roman, smiling confidently as he intended to flaunt his superiority by exhibiting the power of those who followed him. Name Alyssa Crawford title one who endures, luck plus 100 quirk, Double time bond level, 58 current level, 27 effective level, 81, attribute strength, 49 agility, 115 vitality, 293 intelligence, 59 dexterity, 108 luck, 195 free attributes, 150 perks. Fleet footed, mental fortitude, pain tolerance, skills berserk, heal axe, rip and tear. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.